What's up guys, Hong here, OG Fitness. Welcome to podcast number two. So this one here guys is with Shaddy. For those of you guys who don't know, I'm pretty sure most of you guys know him already, but for those of you guys who don't, he's a, another YouTuber and he's all about uh, the history of grappling. Uh, he specializes in judo, of course, because he's a judoka, but he's also done uh, BJJ. He also uh, practiced Aikido uh, for a very long time, um, you know, sort of like Rokus, uh, you know, Rokus guys, uh, guys know that guy? Um, martial arts journey guy, pretty, pretty cool guy too. He actually switched over from Aikido to MMA, so which is, anyways, off topic. Okay, so uh, we talked about mostly uh, grappling stuff grappling related and of course we talked a little bit we exchanged ideas on how to train um, you know I talked to him about like what I want to do in terms of competition um, at my age and we went back and forth on that what are the best approaches and, and and whatnot and we also touched on really a lot of things to be honest guys I don't remember everything we talked about but we did speak for three hours I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast I'm gonna put a link below uh, to his channel and I believe that anything regarding the history of grappling, whether that be judo, BJJ, sambo, wrestling, like you guys have to go check out his channel. Like he's super well researched. Unlike me, like my specialty is more, and he actually helped me clear, clear this up because I really felt intimidated when I got on the, the podcast with him because my martial arts history is not all that good, you know? But he explained to me, we all have our specialties. You know, me, I'm more of a fitness for martial arts type of guy, specifically at this point for judo and for, for grappling. Uh, and of course, you know, martial arts in general. And him, well, his strong point is all the research that he does and the history and of course making it, um, you know, all come together so that we understand where all of these techniques and all of these um, different type of mindsets and cultures come from and so on and so on. So it's, it's really uh, cool, you know? So I suggest that if you guys are wondering about the differences between any kind of type of martial arts slash grappling slash whatnot, <clears throat> his channel is the one that you should go to for, uh, you know, for all your historical needs, so to speak, right? In terms for martial arts and specifically grappling and even more specifically judo. So enjoy guys. I'm gonna cut it up of course and make it shorter. I mean, make uh, short clips for you guys to, so you guys can kind of like, um, well, you know, listen to it here and there and kind of pick and choose what you want to, uh, the subjects you actually want to listen to. But for those of you guys who watch the whole, who want to watch the whole podcast, here it is. And yeah, uh, I had a great time. And definitely, I think uh, it's somebody I'm going to keep in touch with and it won't be the last time we do a podcast, but uh, let me know what you guys think. And uh, there you go. Podcast number two. Peace. Okay. So we're recording in, in progress. I don't know if you heard that or not. I heard it. Saw and heard Okay. 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 Yeah. Let's, hey, let's, let's dive right in. First of all, uh, thanks for, you know, like doing this with me. Like, uh, I really, I've been binge watching your videos since you told me since last week, because you told me, uh, you know, Hey, yeah, let's, let's do a podcast together. And, uh, yeah. So love your stuff, honestly. And there's so much to talk about, but you know, I'm going to, uh, do my best not to go all over the place and keep it, uh, keep it relevant to, to grappling. <laughs> And I don't think you need much introduction because um, everybody in my community knows who you are, you know, and a lot of people refer like to you like, hey, you should watch Shaddy's video regarding, uh, you know, judo versus BJJ or versus Sambo and this and that. And they, they quote you a lot. So so it's really cool. I think that uh, the guys are really going to enjoy this, uh, you know, watching us uh, have this discussion. Give me very happy and, you know, I'm very happy that we're here and we're going to have a hopefully a very productive talk. <laughs> yeah yeah oh i'm sure we will i'm sure we will hey so <clears throat> let's 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 dive in right away because you were talking about um before we we got on uh started recording you talked about you going on open mat and uh and and something there, there was some some little point that you wanted to uh talk to me about regarding there was one time uh like i've been to open mats uh for like almost three years now, like obviously with the, with the whole thing that's been like the, 
the world situation, obviously that was limited in the last year and a half, but uh, I, especially the first two years I've been to open mats, uh, either judo or BJJ, like you see how they roll and then you go to judo open mats, um, you see how they do their newaza and their stand up and uh, I was in BJJ open mat and then there was this judoka that opened up a discussion and I found it to be very uh, interesting because I always talk about the two inter like interchangeably, um, whether it's self-defense, whether it's against each other. Uh, and he said something that it's far more interesting for a judo guy or far more um, beneficial for a judo guy to learn BJJ for his judo uh, than a BJJ guy learning judo for his BJJ. And I found that to be very logical since, uh, you know, when I start in the stand-up with BJJ, like especially the, the advanced one, like uh, purple belt, brown belt, even black belt, even if you get to do your sweep or your takedown and uh, really have them in a very good position once you land, not necessarily in their guard, uh, I find that, that it serves you very little. Like if they're more advanced, obviously they're going to get out of whatever position you put them in. And then they're going to proceed to impose their own game slowly, then eventually get the win or they would just end up controlling you the entire round. So uh, a takedown in BJJ, like I'm talking about a takedown when it comes to BJJ, it's not just, you know, a takedown. It's, yeah, it's a split second, but in order to master that takedown, you've done judo, you know uh, how much time it takes to really craft a takedown. The, not only the repetitions, so many details, like a, a simple Ochiyari, I'm still finding new details for it, uh, whether it's in the hands, it's in the legs, uh, how to get in, how to grip, how to trap them into it. Uh, there's just so much, like even Neil Adams, which he's now a ninth down, he's still saying, there's just always something, a little bit of detail you can add to a throw or something that's very basic. And I found that very true. And in order to really craft a good Uchimata or Serenage uh, to take it to BJJ, which is going to barely serve you anything, in my opinion, yes, it's not that interesting, but to have very good escapes from pins, uh, to have very good transition, you know, you're on, you landed on top from a throw. It's a Uzari. You get to take it, you know, to win in Neiwaza. I, I found that that it's very, it's more logical, yes, to add some BJJ to your judo than to have, you know, to go through the, I would say, tireless amounts of reps of judo throws to take them to your BJJ. Even wrestling, same thing. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I understand what you mean because. <clears throat> Well, you know, like taking a, a judoka, and I remember my, my first coach, he was explaining to me that once you, if you're a judoka, it's very easy for you to transition afterwards uh, to BJJ or to wrestling. Because you already have like these skill sets that translate, that carry over very well. But if you try to do the opposite, if you come from BJJ and then you go to judo, it, it's, it's like, um, it's a whole new world. All of a sudden, you know, you have to learn so many things. And like you said, it takes uh, forever for you to, to do, actually um, be able to execute a throw in Randori against, you know, somebody who actually is trying to do the exact same thing to you. So um, where was I going with this? It's definitely um, easier for, in my opinion, for a judoka to transition, uh, for lack of a better term, down to, to the ground, you know, to BJJ and wrestling. Than, than the opposite. And I think that for, uh, for a BJJ player, it's important for them to learn <clears throat> some kind of takedown because, you know, all fights start standing, pulling guard is, is it, for, for, for sports jujitsu, it's, it's fine. But at the same time, I mean, you know, like uh, it's still kind of, it's, it's kind of silly in a sense, you know, that, that you, if, if all you could do is pull guard, you don't have any other options. It's, it's kind of funny, but you have to learn takedown. So what would be the solution in your opinion? First of all, when it comes to like the pulling guard thing, um, that, that's what I'm trying to say. If you take your judo to BJJ, that's not necessarily like I'm, I'm talking about the stand-up. I'm not talking about the, if you, you do very good Neiwaza or whatever. I'm talking about the value of that throw, like the time you put into that throw to take it to BJJ, it's not... Com like competition wise it's not worth the investment like on the street it's very worth it like you slam them boom it's over mm -hmm. probably gonna get into legal trouble but that's a whole different discussion <laughs> but what i'm talking about 
is uh, um, like, for example, you, you're you up against someone that has a brilliant, say, Z, uh, like a half guard or uh, closed guard or De La Hiva or whatever, and you, and you slam them and they ended up on their back with open legs. Like you gave them a gift in a sense. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like all this trouble to perfect the throw and I ended up putting him in a position that he wanted to be in, you know? Like mm -hmm. I, it's happened to me quite a, quite a lot. So you throw them, they turn around, they, they hook your leg or whatever. Or, and then, you know, even like if they didn't get you right away, like obviously they, like you put them in a position that they want to be in. So uh, that's what I'm trying to, to say is that, is it worth it to take all this effort for a judo throw to take it to BJJ? Not really, but the BJJ that you learn for your judo, it is worth it because a lot of fights are ending up in Neiwaza. Just watch the, the women's Japanese team. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, takedowns, yeah, obviously you need to learn takedowns. Um, John Danner said, uh, you can be a world BJJ world champion not knowing a single takedown, but when it comes to self-defense, takedown is a necessity. So you need to be at least comfortable standing up. You know, like I'm, the only thing that I know how to do is be on my back. That's where all my abilities unleash. That's not necessarily, that's not a good thing on the streets. So competition wise, do whatever you want. It's sports. Um, if, if you're a guard player, um, do your thing. If you're a takedown guy, like for example, obviously uh, it can carry over to something good if you have a very good top game, meaning you're a great guard passer, you're very strong, you're very physical. Um, also, if you have very good uh, koshiwaza or hip tosses, that, that's going to land you right into side control, you know. But if you're someone that's very uh, half and half and then you're doing a takedown against a very good card player, eh, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah. It's a nuanced thing. Well, you know, like the solution that I, that I found for, for that, me as somebody who started actually in BJJ, uh, and then after that transition to judo, which is like the weirdest thing, because usually people, the judo, because they, they, they transition over to BJJ, uh, you know, because maybe of injuries, maybe they just, you know, want to have fun. And, you know, it just kind of benefits them uh, more in a sense, right? Like, like what you mentioned <clears throat> is that if you throw somebody, you know, like you have to adapt your judo. <laughs> like if you're fighting in BJJ rules, okay, so what you have to do is Obviously, you know, these guys are going to pull guard. So let's say they actually do stand up with you. You sweep them. It's the transition. So right away when you, um, the transition between standing and the ground. So as soon as you throw them or sweep them right away, you have to be, you have to be, <clears throat> you have to pass the guard or you take their back at depending least, on how they at fall. Least, yeah. Or at least land in half guard with a cross face. Like if you get their head and you're in their half guard, that's pretty good to start with. But um and, and like maybe I, I, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think I might have exaggerated a bit, but if you, if, if it's someone your level, like you say you're a white belt and he's a white belt or you're a blue belt and he's a blue belt, but you have the takedown uh, aspect and you have good guard passing uh, game, mm -hmm. a takedown is very good. But uh, is it worth it for just two points to do all this rigorous work? The, I think the, the main argument is the, is the rigorous work worth it? If he's eventually going to pull guard, there's barely no need. You know, if you're a very good guard passer, okay, fine, I'll do my thing. But um, if you're the same level and you have a very good top game, then yeah, obviously, it's, if you throw in, you know, the takedown aspect into the mix, it's going to help you, obviously. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, uh, but yeah, it's far more interesting to take BJJ into judo and finish it on the ground in case you happen to score a Wazari, then to go all this effort for just uh, for two points. Okay, you mean somebody who doesn't know how to take down, like who doesn't know judo yet, like a BJJ guy who uh, who wants to add, like uh, who wants to practice takedowns, and then who decides to, okay, I'm going to learn BJJ because, uh, you know, I, I want to learn how to take down. Yeah, I think, I think that, in that sense, it's, uh, hmm it might, you're right, it might not be worth it because it takes so long to, um, to, to master uh, certain techniques in judo. There's a lot, like you have to, uh, you know, and Travis Stevens mentioned this, like if you do BJJ, you have to do BJJ. If you do judo, you got to learn judo. You can't try to like intermingle it because you can eventually, but at the beginning you have to do, 
you have to practice that art. And then yes, you know, I, I agree. I agree. One hundred percent. I at first I tried to do both, and I was first of all I couldn't recover well. You're a personal trainer. I'm I'm sure you talk about recovery a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I couldn't recover, and two, there was just so much on my plate that uh, I ended up sucking in both. So. Uh, I would say get really good at something or at least very decent, uh, say a purple belt or brown belt in BJJ. That's a long time. Or at least a black belt in judo, then go to BJJ. But trying to do both at the same time and beginner at both, I don't necessarily recommend it unless you're doing it, you know, twice a week this and then twice a week that, but your evolution is going to be very slow. Yeah, you're right about that. You know, and that's why like me, when I did BJJ, that's all I did. I did, I did BJJ for six years, so I had a pretty uh, good foundation. And then from there, like, and, 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 uh, and then from there, I remember like my, uh, one, of, one of the clubs that I was at for BJJ, they were offering judo lessons once a week. And it was judo for BJJ. But it wasn't, uh, it was fun, but it didn't really get me all that much better, to, to tell you the truth. Like, yeah, you know, I could throw some guys, but, you know. It wasn't um, looking back now, knowing what I know, uh, because now I'm a brown belt in judo and I've competed and all. So now looking back now, I'm like, yeah, you know, it wasn't really the best use of my time, to be honest. And after when I finally like left BJJ, I did that for six years. <clears throat> then I went to, to judo. That's when I really just focused on judo and then like my, my skill level, you know, progressively steadily and progressively went, uh, went up and I was able to transition. I was able to use my BJJ skills in, uh, in judo newaza, you know, so to speak. So I, I, I think you're right about that. You touch on a good point. If you do both at the same time, it's going to take you forever to get good. And yeah, I would say, um, like for example, now, if we go back to, to the point of competition, if let's say they're both black belts and one decided I want to add some judo because he has a good, very good base. If you throw a black a BJJ black belt and they, they have very good guard recovery or at least put you in a position that you're not 100% comfortable with, it's not worth it. To do mm. all this work for a takedown, then he's just going to end up you know, having his guard, the stuff that he loves, eh. Yeah, yeah, I think that it has to be super adapted. Like once, let's say you you're you become a your BJJ black belt, and now you want to improve on your takedown game. The problem is like you would have to focus on judo for a very long time before you're actually able to pull it off. So you would have to have a coach, somebody who, who's uh, who who has let's say for example a judo black belt and and a BJJ black belt, so he could he could bridge the gap. He could show you. Uh, takedowns that you could really work on that would work for you uh, also in, in competition. So you don't just, um, you know, John Danaher was talking about this. He was talking about um, uh, Tomo, Tomo Nage. Uh, he was talking about for, for you know, like takedowns for, um, uh, for, for BJJ, you know, but like from, from taking stuff from techniques from judo. So Tomo, Tomo, Tomo Nage, oh, or do so in Nage. Sumigeshi uh, and yeah. uh, there was something else he, he mentioned, but I forgot which one, but uh, essentially those two things. And there was another take that, Oh, Oh, uh, ankle picks. Yes. Ankle picks. So he was talking about those three takedowns uh, as a basis that to, to um, develop your, your takedown game for BJJ, because those are like, you're already um, um, kind of somewhat doing those uh, techniques slash positions in your BJJ game already. You know, so it's not something completely foreign to you. Whereas if uh, we try to teach you to do uh, Ushimada, yeesh, that's complicated. That's complicated. Years and not necessarily going to land you in the position that you want. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's because uh, now all of a sudden, like if you um, like if you throw somebody for <clears throat> in a BJJ competition, well, ideally, you got to stay standing up. You got to stay standing up and then right away you want to land uh, depending on the technique, you're going to want to have to land in, uh, in side control or yeah, upper, yeah. Yeah, upper bot side control or, you know, worst case. case. Like a or Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or, you know, like if you, mm, you do something and you land in half guard, that's fine. But if you do something and then, uh, you have the habit of uh, rolling, you know, rolling with the opponent because in judo, like you want, you know, you want your epon. So you always, 
rolling with the oh. dude. And then yeah, crocodile it, rolls are, are, are dangerous. But, but hey, you know, I just thought of something. <clears throat> but if you're, if you're training for self-defense, though, what do you think of training two times judo a week and then two times BJJ? Now mixing it up makes sense if your goal is not to, um, um, to, to compete. The, I, I wanted to make a disclaimer that, uh, you know, if you're a BJJ black belt and I said it's not worth it to train judo, talking specifically in the competition aspect, if you're going up against a BJJ black belt, I'm not talking that your judo training is going to be wasted, all of it, obviously not. But um, for self-defense, yeah, but uh, like even I would say self-defense purposes, I would say start only judo. Uh, you're gonna, immediately you're going to learn to stay comfortable on your feet standing up and two they will give you the basis of newaza because first of all on the street you don't want to be on the ground for too long and also you want to learn the basics of pinning um uh, the basis of like uh, shinoaza or choking um uh, you're not gonna do juji gatame again there's legal ramifications wherever but the basis of pinning of saikomi are found in judo so for beginners that don't know anything either pjj or judo and you want self-defense in mind start with judo yeah, yeah, you know, like um, it's a funny thing, but on my channel, like there's uh, there's so many people that write in and tell me like, oh, you know, uh, you know, I was thinking of doing something, you know, and uh, I was thinking of BJJ, but after watching your videos, I'm gonna go do judo. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, and and the truth is, like, um, I, I agree with you there. Like, if you if you want to do self defense, <clears throat> then if, if your if your goal is self defense, then yeah, judo is a better option because you know every fight starts standing, and you're gonna develop better habits for overall for for you know self defense. And and the funny thing is that after watching a whole bunch of your videos, I come to realize now because me compared to you in terms of uh, knowledge of of uh, grappling history, like I'm a meathead. <laughs> <laughs> no, and no. everyone has their focus is like you, you you focus on the fitness aspect the longevity uh you know john danaher wants to win the competition like everyone has their own uh like concentration i take it more of the of the um like the academic side of martial arts if you want to say i don't know but i mean that's not that's not necessarily saying you're a meathead you just have a different focus that's fine yeah yeah okay i i feel better now thanks <laughs> <laughs> uh but what was i saying again um but yeah essentially uh you, you know how you ever heard the joke uh bjj stands for basically just judo and well, uh funny that's funny okay, yeah keep, keep going oh no no so i was just saying that like i like you know when when i heard that before i was like I found it funny, but at the same time, like, oh, I don't think that's necessarily true. But then after watching a lot of your videos and you talking about the history of it all, that's now, now I realize that it, 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 it kind of is. <laughs> Sports wise, it tends to be a bit different. Let me tell you a story. Even before BJJ 1918, there was this, uh, I, I wouldn't say call it, I wouldn't say scandal, but it was a bit of a scandalous uh, event. It was 1918. Um, I believe it was like some high schools in Kyoto, maybe, and they were um, they were up against the Tokyo High School. It was like the Kosen. Kosen is the the upper schools where they would go like team against team, and um, you had the Kyoto students uh, who were under Tsunetani Oda, and the Kyoto students were I I forgot who, but um, Basically, they were following the old Kodokan curriculum of a lot of takedowns followed by Neiwaza. So like judo today, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, Oda would like send his students to Tokyo to spy on them. And the Tokyo students would uh, close their shades or their curtains. And so they would sneak in. They would uh, pretend they were like washing laundry and their geese and or they would work there just so they would know like what are these Tokyo students doing so we could beat them and then Oda did uh, basically you know that's how you learn history repeats itself everyone talks about 1993 well in 1918 Oda decided that hey let's just drop everything including takedowns and focus solely on the ground and then if a fight starts I'm pulling guard I'm taking the guy to the ground and I'm beating him with superior Neiwaza 
that's what happened. And then Tokyo met with Oda students and Tokyo lost. I believe not all the matches, but they lost. And it was all guard pull, just really, you know, beating them with Spear Newaza. And then Kano wrote this article um, in the mag, uh, like a school magazine, maybe. I forgot, but it was basically calling guard pullers cowards. And, you know, in self defense, <laughs> in self defense, you're going to get kicked in the face. And I mean, I, I tend to agree with him because, like, it, that's, I, what are you going to do in self defense? Pull guard? No. And uh, so basically, uh, and that's something that Pedro Valente also said during our talk. Like he says, in a competition, in a very controlled environment, one against one, taking the other guy to the ground, knowing that you have better ground, that's a great strategy for winning. And it happened in '93, but Oda thought of it in 1918, and um, that's essentially it. That's what I'm trying to say is that you know, if you have great takedowns and the guy just ended up being on the ground and he's better at the ground, your takedowns basically mean very little in a sports context that's insane so essentially like that just means that history is repeating them it, it, repeating itself because now it's the same thing between judo and bjj like judo guys are like pulling guard is like uh it's it's dishonorable it's a shame you like it's it's not manly yeah yeah you know, like i'd kick you in the face if this was a real situation and then BJJ guys are like, well, yeah, I choke you out on the ground. You suck. You know, like my, my blue belt is worth a black belt in judo on the ground. You know, you, you might have heard that before. And uh, so, so this is like, um, it's, it's an ongoing feud, you know. But, you know, you know, somebody said something really funny. You know, Frank Mir, the uh, UFC, uh, uh, used, to be, used to be in the UFC as an MMA fighter. And uh, I think he was a champion at one point. But he was saying how essentially a crappy win is better than a, than a, than, a, than, a, than a crappy loss, something like that, something to that effect. Or I think it was a crappy win is better than a, in, than a spectacular loss. Uh, <laughs> in, a set, in, in, in a sports context. So what that means is that, you know, like when, when Kyoto was fighting uh, Tokyo and then the Kyotos were spying, like, uh, you know, to, to see what was going on there. And then they're like, okay, guys, these guys are monsters that, you know, like uh, Tachiwaza, we're not going to beat them there. So let's just beat them on the ground. They'll never see it coming. They won't think that we're going to pull guard and we're going to kick their ass and we're going to win. And too bad, you know? That's why there's just so many rules in judo today. It's because of these people uh, you know, taking the gray and then exploiting it. You know, I talked with Neil Adams. He says, I don't want to leave any black and white. So it's basically like that. Uh, everything from leg locks to guard pulling. Uh, I believe guard pulling was banned, uh, banished somewhere around the early 20s because in Kyoto, there was just so much guard pulling. Like There's even a, a later feud between Oda and Yaichibe. Each had a team and guard pulling was just everywhere. So for example, Ashigarami was uh, banned, was banished because it was so dangerous. It, uh, it tripped the knee from the inside. So eventually they came up with the knee bar and uh, because there was like, they banned a technique, but not the entire leg locks. But after that, people figured out, like the Kodokan figured out that you can really exploit um, like gray areas. So don't ban just a technique, ban everything from leg locks. And back then, you know, ligament surgeries and ACLs, you know, it wasn't a thing. Even today, like recovering from ACL surgery, it's, it's hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So I mean, I mean, that's how the like the whole like judo issue with the rules started because there's just so many people exploiting gray area. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I understand, I understand. Hey, before I forget, you know, like because you touched on how like Kyoto went over to spy on on uh, on Tokyo and they were pretending uh -huh. pretending to do laundry and and all, you know, that, that that's such a funny thing because I want to tell you this little story about how. Um, uh, this is supposedly very common practice with the Japanese. Okay. So there was the, uh, a couple of years ago, I forgot, like prior to lockdown, I don't know, 2008, 18, sorry, 2000. Yeah. Probably 2018 or something. We had the, uh, uh, Montreal grand prix for, for judo and, uh, Teddy, uh, Teddy Riner, he came over to compete. Yeah. yeah. And so me and my coach and some other guys, you know, from the club, like we go watch it, we buy our tickets. And we're, we're, we're sitting up there in the stands, you know, like pretty high up and we're watching it. And then at one point we, we all look back and we're like, Hey, we look, we, we look back up there 
and then guess guess what we see we see like these uh these japanese guys right with a tripod and cameras and and they're they're, they're hiding themselves like they, they're wearing hoodies and and, and uh you know like they have their hoodies on and they yeah. kind of cover they try to cover the, the 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 tripod a little bit so you can't see them but what they're doing and then i say hey what the hell are these guys doing and my coach is like yeah yeah it's the japanese man they do that all the time because wherever teddy uh, teddy reiner uh, am i saying that right teddy because in french i said it i say teddy rene teddy uh, teddy rene rene okay so wherever he goes the japanese always send a team of spies to record to record the fights you know and, and they sit they always sit in the stands and they record it them. worked it worked <laughs> I mean, Kageura was eventually able to beat him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 yes. in it's, his hometown. Mm, yeah, yeah. That was the last. Um, yeah, I remember because and and that broke his winning streak because he was winning. I think he was out hundred year winning more. streak. Ten year winning streak. Ten years and one hundred fifty four fights. Yeah. I remember reading that. But that's not the longest streak. It's actually Yamashita of two hundred something. Mm. in a, a far shorter time actually yeah that's insane so 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 when you when you you mentioned like how kyoto sent their spies to uh to uh you know to tokyo uh i think they're really into spying man like you know ninja ninja stuff right <laughs> and, and, and covering stuff because um i i did a video a while back it's uh, about uh retrieved and uh, translated samurai scrolls it was from the Takeuchi, Takeuchi or Takenouchi. It, it was a courier basically. Um, and a lot of it talks about, it didn't show any technique because if somebody found them, like they're, they're gonna know their secret basically. It was talking about, uh, don't talk badly about other schools. I found that very respectable and honorable. I, I was very amazed. And two, um, don't show everything you know for comp uh, for you know self defense or also to for the integrity of the school because um, they had self defense it wasn't a war because during the Edo period it was very peaceful so it was either you know gangs fighting each other or a competition of jujitsu schools so for self defense and the competitions they kept everything secret and um, 1920s again let's go back to 1920s a hundred years after that scroll maybe. Um, I believe that scroll was written somewhere in the 1840s. I forget. I, there's just mm -hmm. so many informations that I tend to forget some details. Um, it was the 1920s and Kanemitsu, the same guy that invented the knee bar, invented the triangle choke. So it was 1921, 1922. Um, and it's because it appeared in Oda's book. Oda was his rival, actually. He invented those two techniques beat Oda and it appeared in Oda's book so they saw it they, and then they started to document it so it wasn't him that documented it so it was and he was from the Takeuchi Ryu school the same school that had those principles that wasn't documenting techniques keeping secret but the guy that documented it was actually his rival so there was the printing press there was uh, you know technology obviously beat this type of uh, secrecy so that's why a lot of people tend to confuse that it was Oda that invented the triangle, when in fact it was Kanemitsu and his uh, student uh, Kanamaru mm -hmm. um, that actually came up with it. So you can still see that mentality uh, still in the, going into even after they became judokas and left their old jujitsu school. Okay, okay. Intriguing. But you mean the mentality of um, of keeping things secret? Or All right, yeah. Yeah, whether it's, you know, spying, like you said, or keeping, uh, having your secrecy or having your, uh, you know, tricks up your sleeves for your students in competition. I, I do believe that mentality is still very much alive. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, um, tell, should tell you another funny story. Like uh, at the club where I train, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a board. <clears throat> there's a board for uh, the techniques that we have to practice, that we have to master. You know, like there's certain techniques for, uh, you know, uh, Tachiwaza and then Niwaza. And then this is how, this is the sequence. This is what you have to master. This is like the core elements, the core techniques that are going to help you become a better competitor. And um, 
on, on the, on that board, and uh, it's a little bit all over the gym and on that board and, and it, it's written, do not take a picture of this, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and my coach told me, don't take a picture of that, you know, because we, you know, sometimes when, um, you know, we're, we're there, we're students, we know we're filming, we're filming our, our, our randories, we're taking pictures and all that. He said, like, you can do whatever you want, but don't, don't take a picture of that. Don't post it because that's like, cause we're, we're a competitive club. So we want to be, we want to keep our, um, you know, system and our, our, our methods for ourselves because we're competing. So I think that when, when you're competing, it makes sense to not uh, divulge everything that you're doing. You know? Strategy is about hmm? like everything you do. Like, is, I mean, that's what strategy is. You know, I have something that you, you're not going to see coming. And when you see it coming, it's already too late. I mean, that's what a strategy is. But I'm talking about having like their own techniques, uh, their own teachings. Uh, for example, there's a lot of things in the Kodokan. You know, um, if you see, like, go on YouTube, see a tour video or something. There's a lot of stuff that they couldn't film because it says no filming. Or, or you see some randori during the, like, uh, on the upper uh, root, like, not the rooftop, the, um, the upper level of the Kodokan like where they do the randori with the orange and the green uh, mats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's basically it. So there's like, and the museum, for example, the history museum, the archives, no filming. Yeah, yeah, I was in, I was in that museum because I passed by the Kodokan once um, a couple of years back uh, when I was there with my wife in Japan. And when I went into the museum, like you can't, you can't take any pictures or you can't film. So yeah, I understand, you know. Season, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if it's, if it's a business, like a school, like, Hey, come to our school, like you, you'd want everyone to post and show pictures of what you have. So it's like indirect marketing, but they don't do that. Yeah. 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 Oh, you mean like the, the Kodokans, they don't, uh, at Kodokan, they don't do that. They don't let people film and, and, uh, promote. It's, it's for, for, uh, I, I would, I, I don't want to put on my tinfoil hat, but like, they obviously have something that doesn't like, it doesn't want to be shared. Like, even if you see it. You're not gonna remember all of it, or if you remember something of it, I mean, you go and tell it's not gonna be 100%. You know, like the, the whole thing, like now with the media and everything, it's very easy for something to get out. So just say no filming. You know, sometimes we remember something and then we, we're very sure of it, but then when we come back to see it, it's very different because they say, I don't know if it's very true, but when you remember something, you're actually remembering the last time you remembered it, something like that. Yeah, but that's how your mind functions. So I would like, is there something that they don't want everyone to know? I probably, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, uh, you know, like techniques are techniques, right? All the techniques are out there. We all know them. I think it comes down to strategy and setup and tactics that that's what they want to keep for themselves. And of course, if you're a uh, high level, I'm sure every team is doing that. So yeah, 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 exactly. Like at my club, like we could, uh, we could film ourselves uh, doing randori and which is something that we're going to do um, when things open up again is Friday nights is, uh, is rumble night. So we essentially just warm up. And then after that, we fight for like an hour and a half, two hours, randori, nonstop, nonstop. So my coach told me, no problem. You can, um, when, when we can do that again, when we open up, then you can, uh, we can go, we can do a YouTube live, you know, we could just put the camera there, film, and then, you know, have people watch, uh, upload that live or, or later and just have people like watch us rumble and fight, you know, and, and it, it's, it's good for the club. It's good for me. But one thing we won't do is he's, he, he wouldn't let me film a class. Like if he's giving a class and showing technique and what he's working on with, with us, then he's not going to let me film that, which, which is fine. Like, I understand, you know, yeah. like, uh, like you see the competitions, they're all on, uh, they're all on, you know, you can go to IGF and you see everything, but, uh, you know, obviously the teachings are going to show you everything. That's like, you know, you and me are going to go like a, at a poker match and I'm like, uh, Hong, here's my card. It's like, no one's going to, no one's going <laughs> to no do that. But, uh, but, uh, I think, uh, what I'm worried about or what interests me is some not techniques, but teachings that eventually might get lost because if you kept something and then I keep something and I don't teach my students all of it and then you do the same 
I die, and then they're, they're left with a little bit less, and then they're going to do the same. You know, that uh, the, the heritage of, like the technical heritage is, is something that really interests me, um, kind of like leg locks or stuff that has been banned. Like uh, the Ashigar army, you read so many people have been injured from it in the past. I mean, it's one of the most dangerous of judo's techniques. It's in the Kinshiwaza for a reason. But, you know, call a guy, say, hey, do Ashigarami on me. You're not going to tap because they're not going to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an angle where you enter, then you have your hips very deep. Um, I, I stumbled upon uh, like a very comprehensive guide of a of, uh, Katami no Kata, where he goes a little bit more into detail of Ashigarami. And then I would see why so many people could not pull it off. So that's what I'm worried about is that um, something that can really, you know, you know. Benefits, benefit us. Yeah. Judo capabilities on steroids basically be gone. You know, you're going to have to go through the, the old cycle of, oh, I was doing this mistake that everyone does. And, you know, like that maybe after retirement, like if you go see the Inoue um, uh, box set, like there's... Um, do you have it? Like the fighting films in a way box set? Uh, fighting films? Yeah, yeah, I have fighting films. Mm -hmm. Do you watch the in a way DVDs? No, no, I haven't watched it yet. You're going to see he's, gonna, he's, be, uh, he's doing very, very basic stuff. As a white belt or orange belt, like well, when I was, when I was watching it, I was like, wow. But now when, you know, you're, I've been doing this for quite some time, I've looked back on it and he's doing very basic. Now, obviously the media and the tutorials back then uh, were revolutionary compared to now. Like now everyone can post a video and show him like, hey, here's how you do this. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can see that he's doing stuff like the, um, for example, you see the Japanese when they do a demonstration of Uchimata in a seminar, he's like doing Hanegoshi. Mm -hmm. But in competition, you see something completely different because the way they do it in competition, it's very hard to do in Uchikomi mm -hmm. or Nage Komi. So you see, uh, and the DVD is very basically like this. His takedowns, when he's demonstrating them in the studio, that's all demonstration. Like, And then when they show the competition examples, it's completely different. So you're left out with a lot of details that they're not showing you because he's doing it in Nage Komi and Uchikomi form and not uh, competition form. So you have to look at the competition examples yourself uh, rewind, play it very slowly, etc. So, um, again, at the time it was very revolutionary. It was around 2009, mm -hmm. but now you look back, it's, it's like, he's showing you the basics of his game. He's not going to show you everything even after he retired. Mm, do you think that, do you think this is more like of a Japanese thing? Because you know how, like, uh, they're, they're more, very, very, very secretive about certain things because judo is their sport. It's their creation. So they're very, and they're still very highly competitive and, you know, they're, they're like top of the food chain in the Olympics. So they're being very secretive about it. But then when you look at the American his students, that's why he, I don't, maybe it's, it's yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. We're, whereas the Americans, we're all about like selling everything we know. <laughs> it's capitalism. Yeah. Exactly. Um, like for example, look at fanatics, look at fanatic, like uh, uh, Fabio Basile He's still very much competitive. He did this, um, tutorial where he showed everything he knows I and mean, it's found it a bit like but then like for example Fabio Basile um, he throws everything at you like Kochigari, Ochigari, Uchimata uh, every like big throw you know he's gonna throw at you his Deashi Parai is brilliant mm -hmm. but you know in the uh, in the DVD where he shows that he says that he talks specifically that you know in, in Nagekomi or Uchikomi form you do it this but in competition, you cannot do that. You do like this, this. And he's still very much competitive. So I would say, yeah, it probably is a Japanese thing. Yeah, yeah. Because also, I think that, um, you know, there's no, there's no, I believe that there's no secret secrets left under the sun. You know, everything is out there. And with, um, and also the body is made to move a certain way you know, like biomechanics, arms, ligaments, uh, leverage points and all that. And I mean, for, so, so the Japanese, they, they feel like they, 
they still have something, they know stuff that maybe gives them a big edge. So they keep it to themselves. But then at the same time, I mean, we have, we have tape now and we could slow, we could slow motion everything. So we could still like look at what they're doing and uh, we can understand it, you know? So, and in the Americans, since we're more uh, about like making money at, uh, you know, not at all costs, but practically, you know, but so when they make a DVD, they want to uh, sh- like, they can't just show like simple stuff. They have to show like, Hey, like, this is how you do it. It's not for free. Yeah. Yeah. It's not for free, but it's, but it's okay to pay for it too. You know, I, I feel it's not, it's not the end of the world. Like, because if you want, if you wanted to learn these so-called uh, secrets from, from, from Japan, right. You would have to literally go there, train with them. And then for a period of time before they really start, maybe take a like liking to you and trust you enough to actually like coach you, uh, um, how do you say it seriously? So it would come up to the same thing. Cause you would have to invest time to go there. You would have to invest money. You would have to invest there. a yeah. lot of resources. So why not just pay a uh, hundred, two hundred dollars to get the information directly from, um, you know, a, a certain judoka that you, uh, you want to learn from, you know, like, uh, if you want to learn from, uh, uh, um, Fabio Basili, then just buy his DVD, like just buy his stuff on judo fanatics done. Yeah. Like they put it on like sale and it's like $18 and there's always these codes you can use. Like you basically get it for free. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's but like, for example, look at Travis and Jimmy Pedro, like they're constantly pushing judo. They're constantly showing uh, very, like, for example, he recently came out with, uh, with Ayoko Tomorinaga. He says, if you're still a beginner in Yoko Tomorinaga, don't do this because this is something you can add later on when you're very competitive. So, Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, you watch the in a way, it's very like it's the same. Like you, you have the elbow down, you lift, you, you turn, and then oh, this is the entry. Or, uh, but for example, you see him in competition, you see his elbow is flared up, so he's clearly doing something different in competition. So I would say this is maybe for later for his students. You don't want to give everything out, um, and I understand that, of course, uh, he's one of the greatest. And then he's now coaching, and look at his. Uh, his um, prodigies like Ono and Mariyama. So, I mean, I, it's very understandable, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a completely different uh, mentality, I would say. I mean, we're speculating, but uh, it seems though, like uh, we have our stuff, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're keeping our cards close to our chest. Mm, yeah, yeah. But you know, like, it's a funny thing because I feel as though even though they, they keep these things secret, but I mean, when, when one, one of the guys like, um, somebody on his team, uh, cause, uh, uh, he, Kosei is, uh, he, he's the head coach, right. For the, uh, the Japan team. So when, when, when somebody of his teams executes a technique, uh, you know, in competition, it's all film and we see it from there, we could slow it down and we could figure it out, you know, like maybe I can't figure it out, but I could take it to my coach who has more experience than me, you know, sit down and tell him, Hey, we do Uchimata this way. But, you know, I saw this in competition and then we could um, dissect it and, and, and take the time to figure it out. And the funny thing is I started, um, um, well, prior to being locked down, uh, when I was training at my club, I started filming myself, like my randories. <laughs> and the reason why I started filming myself was because I wanted to um, assess my, my current level of skill, my, like to, to find my weaknesses and to find also my strengths. And when I did that, I filmed it and then I brought the video home. I started watching it. And then when I, when I slowed it down, it makes a big difference. Like if you really watch tape and you slow it down, you could really see like what's going on because you have time to think. And I, I believe that that could be done too with uh, any, uh, any footage that you get uh, from, from competition. If the angle is, 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 uh, you know, is clear enough. So yeah, and also cool. when you watch yourself, like sometimes you think you're doing something and then when you watch yourself, you see like, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not good enough. Or uh, for example, I was always very defensive. Like I had a very wide stance and almost hunched over. And then people would tell me the same thing. You're very tense. That's why you're, you, uh, yeah, you try to execute the technique and then you end up being very far away and countered. Then I looked at myself and I'm like, but no, I have a straight back. I can see, but then it, it turns out 
it's so true and not so not only it's true it's very uh like to a very high degree of what they were saying i really hunched over really wide stance to avoid foot sweeps um but then when i try to go in it's uh it's impossible because and i thought that they, they had their hand like we stretched out but it's actually me so you everyone this is for everyone record your randori and then watch it don't not to post it but to see where you are lacking why you couldn't you know execute these techniques why you were countered all of it everyone should see themselves uh doing randori oh yeah and and you know like this is the and i got this idea from uh john danaher because he was talking about like how essentially in five years if you film yourself and you make a, an accurate assessment of uh, your, your strengths and your weaknesses. And the best way to do that, according to him, was to film yourself. Uh, because even if you ask your coach and you ask your teammates, like it's their, their, their vision of it might be skewed. You know, they might think something, but it might not be that. Or they might not give you a whole picture or, you know, just because they don't, you know, they're not really there focused on you paying attention. But if you film yourself and you have, um, you have your, your fundamentals are strong enough you could watch yourself and really, um, even though you know what to do, but when you watch yourself, you're like, and you think you're doing it when you're in the, in the heat of the moment, but you're actually not. That's when I realized for, for myself, I'm like, I, I just, I slow motion when I get thrown. It's like, obviously if I'm doing well against the guy, I could see I'm doing something good, no problem. But when I get like, I get, when I get smashed, that's when I'm like, okay, I got to figure that out. So then I rewind it. I slow it down. And then, now I'm watching. I'm like, and then in my mind, I'm like, okay, I know I have to kill the sleeve. I know I have to grab this. Da, 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 da. What happened? What went wrong? And then from there, there's like these little details that I discover about myself. And I'm like, oh, holy smokes. Like if I could just, and then the, the mistakes repeat itself with other, um, uh, you know, other, uh, other opponents. And then from there, that's what I realized. And what I do is that I like, uh, let's say I'm fighting, uh, for example, if I, if I had a Randori match with you, <clears throat> so I would film it. And then from there, I would, um, I would create a file and it would be Hong versus Shadi. And I would write the date. And then from there, I, I would watch the video and I would open a, a, a notepad and then start writing, let's say match, match number one. <laughs> and then I would take notes of like what happened and like the weaknesses and things that I have to like, um, Excuse address me for a second. Mm -hmm. Wait one second. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, th there's also one thing I wanted to, to touch upon, uh, is that trusting your body, uh, that's something that's very crucial. And I learned that thankfully, because I got something recorded, there was this technique that uh, I could do from very early on. It's not even a white belt technique and I was doing it brilliantly. And uh, after that, they would say like, no, the basics is like this, you enter like this and then, and I got worse at it. And I would try it in Randori, I, no hitting it. Uh, and then I stumbled upon these old recordings, like when I took it of myself. And first of all, um, I saw even like the, like in competition, people were doing the same thing that I was doing as a white belt. And it wasn't because like, I'm some, this genius, but uh, it's because I figured that that's how my body is comfortable doing it. And I was able to do it. But sometimes, you know, we go back to the same thing. And, you know, Chikomi doesn't mean that you have to do it in competition. Uh, or even nagikomi, like in nagikomi, you do something, but then when you're doing randori, you do it completely different. It's because how your body is, how you, maybe it's shaped or how, where you have the explosive force, this leg or that leg or this hand. Um, but I would say if someone told you like your professor, this is, again, this is, this might come out very badly, but if your, your coach or your sensei told you do this, and then after you listen to them, your technique, you were, you were no longer able to hit it, uh, then go back and see where you did wrong and listen to your body more because everyone is, is made differently and we hit the technique differently. So also, you know, trust yourself, not, obviously not to the extreme because, you know, you don't know everything, but keep faith in yourself, like how your body wants to do a technique, how it is shaped, 
etc. You know, that's uh, that's a great point because <clears throat> And you know how you said that when we do uchikomi, we do it one way. And then sometimes we do nagikomi and we do it like the classical way, the way it's supposed to be done. But then we do it completely different in randori. So my, my, um, my thought regarding that would be, well, you know, you could only fight the way you practice. <laughs> and, you know, like, yes, it's important to understand the mechanics of uchikomi and nagikomi of, you know, kuzushi and then, you know, the classic stuff, but I think it's also important for you to, for us to practice how we're actually going to do it in, in, uh, in Randori. So, you know, if your grips are slightly different, then you should practice with that grip specifically, like to, to when you're doing your, your Nagikomi. And, and a funny story, funny story regarding that is that at one point I was, uh, I remember this class, uh, we you know we took out the crash mats. And then from there, like the coach is like, okay, I want you to do uh, this technique, do it like this. I forgot what was the technique. And then I was with um, uh, one of my teammates. Uh, he's a black belt. He used to be on the national team. <laughs> and so then when it was hit, like, I was doing the froze, the Nagikomi. And then when it was his turn, he completely switched his grip around. Like he didn't grip the, 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 the way the coach was uh, uh, told us to grip. And uh, then I told them, you know, I tried to correct them. I said, oh, no, we're supposed to do it like this, like that, like that. And then he's like, yeah, I know, but I've always done it this way. And this way works for me. <laughs> and I, I kind of prefer it this way. And so I'm going to do it my way. And then I was like, that makes sense. <laughs> because he, he knows his body. He knows, he knows like what he's good at, what he's comfortable with and like why like in his mind why would he practice something that he's not even going to use and that it just feels uncomfortable for him because he he's been training for a long time so he told me no this is you know like i'm just going to do it the way like practice what i i know best and what i know works for me for my body type and yeah that made a lot of sense to me so sometimes i think that not not always you have to be careful with this you know, because I, I don't want people to think that, oh, you should listen to your coach and do, do whatever the heck you want. Because, you know, you have to be at a certain level to be able to do this. You know, like if you're a beginner, I would say lean more towards listening to your coach. But if you're a little bit more advanced and you have experience yeah. and you kind of you're, you know, your body, you've done a lot of sports, then maybe, you know, like, like you said, if your coach told you something and now all of a sudden <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't pull it off anymore maybe you should, you know, consider, uh, you know, reanalyzing, reassessing oh. the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, for example, even in the same team, like, look at Ono's entry for Uchimata and then look at Mariyama. Mariyama actually has a back step. He back steps his left leg so he can, like, charge and push while Ono just, like, he's like this and then just chops in directly because... Um, maybe Mariyama wants that explosive entry so he can lift his opponent up while Ono just stabs that leg because it's just so monstrously muscular. So it, everyone is different, I would say. Yeah, 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 yeah. That Exactly. Like, you have to go with your strengths too. And, you know, like, one thing that people, <clears throat> I remember my coach, like, made me realize is that at one point I was trying to learn um, Uranagi. <clears throat> and I wanted to 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 be able to do that and then my coach looked at me and he said listen you don't have the body type to do this and your legs and your your lower back it's not your strong suit like it takes years to develop that and some people have natural uh uh just naturally strong legs and and, and lower back and they've been training this for a while and they've been throwing people and wrestling for a long period so it's their style they're able to do your back hmm? Or the arch in your back, like uh, some backs are more flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't think about that, but yeah, that makes sense too. And and so he told me like that's not your thing. Like you could try to get good at that, but why don't you just do you? And these are your strengths. This is what your style is more uh, in tune with. You know, you're more speed, precision. You have like flexibility. You have mobility. So your judo should be based around that. Don't try to just do copy the copy a certain uh another judoka who you like his style because it looks so cool like you like it but it doesn't mean you should necessarily try to emulate that guy either because that guy maybe has like 
his legs are twice the size of yours and he's been wrestling his whole life and slamming people on their heads with Uranage and you you just learned that like at the age of 35 you know like for example look at like I'm very skinny I I, I cannot do Kvinyashvili's like judo or Iliadis's judo they're built like tanks you're right yeah, yeah, those guys are huge. Like, that's it. You can't emulate guys like that. You know, those guys have, like, I think they have wrestling backgrounds, too, if I'm not mistaken. Like, um, you know, like... Uh, I'm not sure about wrestling, but, like, you cannot do their upper body work the same way. It's just impossible, unless you're fighting women. Like, I'm talking about myself. Yeah, yeah, or, or like, somebody uh, very light, you know? So, uh, you know, kids, you know, teenagers, you, you, could, you could practice on them. But uh, guys uh, of, you know, your height, your weight, eh, maybe not the best uh, way to go. <laughs> you should, yeah, you should go for more. Uh, like, for example, that's why I love Basile's judo. Basile is not particularly strong, mm -hmm. but he gets his opponents moving. And then when he executes technique, they're already doing half the job for him because they were moving. Like, for example, the Kataguruma, he takes you sideways and then he just blocks your legs and gets your arm on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. Or uh, his Dea Shibarai, he, he gets you moving so he can sweep you. Or, you know, he doesn't do something very statically or just lifts you. Like, he, he needs to make sure you're moving and then executes. Because in 73, they're all just very strong. They have Orujov, Ono, uh, Hashimoto, uh, even Anne is very strong. So he needs to get them moving. But, I mean, in my opinion, he should have stayed at 66 because he's, uh, they're far stronger than him. Uh, and also... I would say he would have done a, a lot better in 66, but that's a different conversation. Well, yeah, like you, when you remember um, when he, that match he had with, uh, with Ono, I think it was in Rio, right? I think Dasseldorf. Oh, okay. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't move him. Well, he, he, he tried to move him and then he went for an Uchimata and he was going for it. He was going for it. And then Ono just kind of... <laughs> like turned his, uh, his sleeve and lapel to the other side and that was it. That was it. That was it. And, and like, like absolutely nothing, you know, like if it was, it if it was like a, a, a kid who was trying to throw him and then, you know, he let him play a little bit. And then from there, he's like, okay, enough of this. And he just turned them because, you know, Ono is strong. Like, I think he probably cuts a lot of weight to get down to 73. I don't know if, uh, if that's true or not, but that's what I'm guessing. Actually, he said in an interview, he's naturally at 72. But I think, yeah, Ono, ono is not very lean and he's not very tall. So I would think, yeah, he would cut a lot of weight. So, and also look, look at his forearms and quads. Like you would know that this man cannot be moved. Yeah. Like, yeah from but gripping and... Mm -hmm. and... And you know what? The thing is like, uh, now, now that we know how, how you know, like um, Japanese resort to trickery and spying, maybe he says that on camera. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm 72. <laughs> but he's really like... 80 kilos at said, Basile said he's 72. He would cut down back when he would he was in 66. He would be 71 or 72 naturally. And then he would cut to 66. But oh no, he, uh, no it wasn't uh, it wasn't oh no, it was Basile that said that. So oh, okay, okay, I okay. would say, yeah, so if if he's like far bigger and he's just lost a lot of water weight, he's still like very a lot bigger than uh Basile, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so Basili is at the, uh, he's naturally at 73. Yeah. Then he should go down to 66. Like that would make sense. Big games with the, in the 66. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, by the way, I, um, I listened to the art of, uh, the art of peace by, uh, by, you know, the, the, the founder of Akito. Uh, his name is, uh, Mori, Morihei, you Ishiba? Yes. And it, it's a funny thing because I listened to it because you suggested it in one of your videos <clears throat> to really get a, a grasp of an understanding of his philosophy and all. And you know, you know what it sounded like to me? It sounded like yoga. Yeah. Oh, I can't, I can't hear you. All right, hold on. Okay, now I can hear you. How so? Well, <clears throat> he talks about um, uh, he talks about like uh, harmony. Yeah. Right. That's like uh, 
harmony, inner harmony. And then he talks a lot about like um, um, going within and accessing like your divine nature. Yeah. And I've been, uh, I started meditating about maybe two, two months ago. And I've been following um, um, this meditation practice that I got from uh, Sadhguru, who's a, uh, who's a, who's a yogi, uh, Indian yogi. And yeah. th there's a lot, a lot of overlap, you know? So like, from my understanding, like at the end of his life, uh, Mori Morihei uh, Ueshiba, I hope, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. But like you said, you know, like he, he was, he was in the military, he did wars, he did a whole bunch, you know, and then at the end of his life, I think he was trying to teach people, um, his teachings were more about peace and spirituality, but then he, yeah. was, he was doing it through uh, the art of Aikido. Yes. You know, and, 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 and that's, that's what he was about, like at the end of his life and, and Aikido. So it was really interesting to me because um, when, when I was listening to the book, I was like, wait, there's a lot of overlap here with, with yoga because yoga talks about union. It talks about uh, uh, getting in touch with, um, um, a, a, with the source of creation, which is within, you know, which is divine, which is this and that. And um, yeah, so when I was listening to that, I'm like, this is yoga like 100% um, in my opinion yeah i would say i would say the aikikai style of aikido is more of meditative than martial because you know it, i mean people would disagree and that's fine but uh, he was not very he was a very subtle man he wasn't very clear in what he was doing but um the man had three visions the more he like progressively he became more about you know using these things to actually achieve peace um uh, talking about, you know, there's no victory in injuring someone else. Um, and also, like I said, he went to war, he came back, he went to Manchuria, he, um, many things in his life happened. And, you know, when something happens to someone, you know, regardless of how much you want to analyze, etc., you know, it's still gonna be their experience, that's fine. But uh, if their experience and their teachings do not serve your purpose, then maybe you should go to something else. Like, for example, I'm more aligned with what Kano's way of thinking and saying martial arts than Morihei Ueshiba. Um, he went more into the meditative aspect of it. Um, you know, like I said, for example, you have the you have your way of martial arts in terms of longevity, fitness, staying healthy, body and nutrition and your joints, etc. And also martial arts, I'm more into the um, like academic, I want to read a little bit more about this person or that person or these events, what they can teach us. Again, everyone has their own interests. Martial arts are very big, but to him, it's more about um, trying to, you know, like when you say meditating, etc. It's more about, you know, when when does one meditate? Maybe they want to uh, become more at ease with themselves, uh, breathe, relax, not let everything, you know control them mentally i think we all need some meditation in our lives but uh he went more into that route and depending on why you want to train aikido mostly it's for you know to be you know confident self-defense etc i would say not the best thing again this is a different subject but uh meditation is one of the aspects of martial arts as you said but i would say he took it you know kind of like the new Chinese martial arts, how they came, but more of a Budo, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. I understand. Like he took it uh, where, where where he, you know, at that at that phase in his life and from his experiences, that's where he wanted. To, uh, that's yeah. where he was taking it. And you mentioned something in one of your videos, and I believe this to be true: is that <clears throat> for Aikido to actually be effective, you already have to know how to fight. So, yeah, like you cannot understand uh, where he's coming from unless you you yourself live some type of, you know, experience some resistance in your life. Like, for example, um, um, you had like you're married, you, you're married? Uh, yeah, like, yeah, married. Okay. Married, married. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're married, you, you lived in several countries, you went there, you did that, you learned so much in life. You did two, mar two martial arts or maybe more. 
um, you cannot, for example, come up to a 12 year old who still has a lot to learn in life and then tell them your side of story and your perspective on life and then expect them to fully embrace it. They still have to go through a lot of things by themselves in life and learn them you know, from their own experience. That's why the, the human race, if you read literature from 200 years ago, 300 years ago about really personal things, regardless of how much we've evolved as a society, we still feel like a lot of things still apply to us because regardless, we still have to experience things uh, from our own eyes or two eyes, basically. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand perfectly what you mean because if, uh, if, if let's say I was 13 years old and you start telling me, well, you know, like you start talking about the spiritual aspect of martial arts, about inner mastery, about harmony, I would look at you and be like, no, I want to learn how to fight because that's, yes. that's cool. You know, I saw that on TV and that's what I want to do. So in, in, until you go through enough uh, things like that, more experience in your life. And uh, yeah. yeah, that's why. But me at this point, I feel as though <clears throat> like if I were to go into learn Aikido, I could draw a lot more out of it than if I was 13 years old trying to learn Aikido. Like at this point, because I've, you know, I've, I've trained in, in, well, I, not to be, not to sound cocky, but I, I believe I know how to fight. <laughs> I, I could yeah, take care I mean, of myself. It, like exactly. defense wise, I could I could strike, I could grapple, I do wrestling, I do judo, you know, I do BJJ, you know, and um, so 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 I, I believe I could fight. And and knowing yeah. that, like, and, and and being at a certain level too, I think that um, um, like I could understand Aikido now. Like if you tell me, okay, the guy comes in like this, this is his power. You got to like circle around blah 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 use his own force against him yeah. and from here you grab the joint and you do this i could probably uh benefit i could probably end up integrating that into into what yeah. i already know as much better than somebody who has no background and we, who's just learning straight aikido from from the beginning like yeah the, the, that's the thing when you read his uh his writings you would see that you know, it's uh, let's you know, it's for peace. Uh, they sh these techniques should be done for this. Um, I don't want to injure. I don't want to compete. I should have said, I don't want to injure. I don't want to compete. Dot 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 anymore. Because you know, he's in his in that phase in his life where you know what I've done all of that. I think I want something new. But you cannot uh, read it and comprehend it from you know basically zero training experience or fighting ever because. If you do and you adopt it and you say, you know what, I am peaceful because that's what I used to say. Um, I, I, I'm a black belt in Aikido and uh, I did that because I wanted to learn how to defend myself and I was very, I wasn't as confident as I am today, etc. And I found that, yes, it did help me a lot in a lot of aspects in life in terms of you know, physical fitness, also learning some philosoph philosophical aspect that translated into daily life. But in terms of fighting, uh, I just became when I like a lot of people say peaceful, but I be, I was harmless. There's a difference, you know. Um, you know, if you can fight and you can keep everything in order, then you're peaceful because you're using this force for you know to keep order, to keep uh, yourself, your loved ones safe. That's something. And when you say I don't want to fight because I'm peaceful, but you don't know how to fight, then you're just harmless because anyone can impose anything on you at that point. So. When he said, I don't want to fight anymore. These should be for peace. Yeah, but in that phase of his life, because he learned several jujitsu schools, including judo, then Daitoryu. It's not just Daitoryu, as people think. Uh, he went to war, taught the military after that. So it's, it coming, it's coming from someone that has fought rigorously, then decided that, okay, I want to stop. But you cannot say that when you've never fought or don't know how to fight. There's a big difference. So we need to understand where he's coming from. And like, that's like, for example, there's a new, uh, uh, I would say material or details that were invented for elevations or buildings. I'm an architect, I'm talking about architecture here. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then they're very revolutionary in terms of what they do, et cetera. But that building has a particular foundation in order to have these on its elevation. So I cannot do, uh, these like have these detailing uh, on my elevations without having the proper foundation for it. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's uh, it's a funny thing. You know, um, you ever heard of uh, Jordan Peterson? The uh... yeah, yeah, the sci sociologist, oh, psychologist, something like that. Yeah, psychologist, uh, sociologist, uh, psycholo uh, psychologist, and I think he he was a teacher too. I think yeah. he still teaches, but anyways, he said something to the effects of um, a good man is not a harmless man. A good man is somebody who's capable of extreme violence but yeah. who, who consciously decides to keep that under control yeah i saw that i, I saw Something that like yeah that. and i agree with them yeah yeah. yeah 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 i i think that i i agree with that too you know and that's kind of um that's kind of what we're talking about here like morihei uh Ueshiba, like because of what he's been through now he wants peace now he's like listen i want to use this like the the whole idea of aikido is not to fight you know, yeah. and, and, and yeah, of course, if you, uh, if you're not at that stage, if you know, you haven't been through what he's been through, then obviously, uh, yeah. you know, you're just harmless. If you're just talking out of your, <laughs> if you're just like, Oh, I'm learning Aikido, but you know, I don't fight because I don't want to, but if you know, deep down inside it, because you're, you actually don't know how to fight, not then. fight. Yeah. You're basically mass, like putting some makeup on your insecurities. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's kind of a funny thing, but I feel as though, and this happened to uh, Musashi, uh, Miyamoto Musashi too, is that when you kill enough people, then you become spiritual. <laughs> yeah, like he retreated to a cave, he became like a, like a hermit, basically. Yeah, he wrote his book, yeah. and he got yeah. all philosophical and yeah. spiritual. And you know, so, so, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that all roads lead to that eventually, you know, when you get tired of, you know, doing uh, that. that like that reminds me of those people. Uh, I, I don't mean to like judge or mock anyone, but uh, those extremely religious people. And then you get to talk to them. You, you find out they did absolutely everything in life. Like everything like you can think of that's maybe reckless or irresponsible or, you know, bad habits, whatever. Mm -hmm. They did that. Then they, and then they would tell you that it's made me the man that I am or the woman that I am. But, it's basically like the, the cumulative of these bad choices that you made and you know they were bad. You, in a way, you're redeeming yourself through this. Again, not judging anyone, but you know, I, I tend to see where they're coming from, but it's basically the same, like, like those religious conversions you see of mm -hmm. people, but in martial arts. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So, so uh, you know, like um, the founder of Aikido and even Musashi, like they kind of like, they try to like, right. if, they're probably got a little bit guilty about what they did. And they're like, man, I did it. I would say, yeah, because um, <laughs> Ueshiba, when like around that time, Aikido and everything, there was the imperial regime that basically bullied everyone. Mm. So, and also he, he, infilt like he was in the infantry, so... When he fought against the Russians, I believe 1904, I might be wrong. Um, he basically attacked, and they, they won against the Russians, so he was in the infantry. So, uh, like, he, he was not, he was no weak man. So, I do believe there was some repentance towards the end of it. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it makes sense to me, you know, because at the end of the day, it's like, we're all human beings. Yeah. You know, and I think when you when you get closer, when you see enough death, so to speak, and then you get to the end of your life and you realize that, well, you know, you're going to die and this is all going to be over. So then you kind of start questioning, OK, what was all this about? And yeah. then that's when you get into, um, you know, this whole thing. And yeah, that's when you realize maybe possibly that, you know, we're all kind of um, <clears throat> we're all essentially a piece of life. Yeah. You know, in a physical body and we're all going through this life and, you know, we're going to go back to wherever we came from, you know, so yeah. if we're all a piece of life, so we have that in common. So we're all, you know, so then there's a, there's a certain connection that's, that's kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, certain connection to, to other people, like you, you, you kind of empathize with them. You kind of like, well, that person is essentially me in a sense. You know, it's yeah. you know, like the, the physical, the physical envelope is different and experiences yeah. and whatever, but they're a lot, you know, that's a piece of life. I'm a piece of life. And if we were to take away the shell, the body and the personality and whatever, then we're essentially the same thing. So why would I treat that person? If that person is, is essentially me in a sense, then why am I 
doing bad to this person? Why am I harming them? You know, because harming them is kind of like harming myself. I know that that's a little bit. Yeah, you know, I, I see, I see where you're coming from. Um, but just for the people listening, you don't have to go to war and kill people like Musashi and Yoshiba to do Aikido. Disclaimer: like, If you want to do it because you like it, you see, I think it's cool, and you're not about fighting at all. Please, like, feel free to do so. Um, also, for the people that had religious conversions, I'm talking about, you know, some people that went to the extreme because of life circumstances. Then, you know, they they found something that made them a better person. Again, that's great. I'm not mocking anyone. I'm not judging anyone. Uh, but you know, usually when you see someone that's going in a particular direction and going really deep in it, usually know that they were on on the other side of something else, maybe. So you understand their drive towards the other direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Hey, you know, like I, I learned something I remember from one of my um, one of my old judo coaches in regards to why uh, a ipon, you know, when in competition in judo, when you uh, when you throw someone on their back, it's essentially yeah. over. And when you do osai komi, you know, for uh, twenty seconds, uh, it's over also. Uh, do, do you do you do you know like the significance of that? Like, I know that um, the ippon, especially on the back, is like symbolizes someone's death. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe the osaikomi also like if I can pin you and hold you down that long, like I can easily if it's the battlefield, I can easily pull out a weapon and just end you. So basically, exactly. someone's death. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because um, that's, uh, I, I want to like um, explain that to, to the viewers out there um, that the reason why, like in judo, like if you, hmm? wait, yeah, the reason, me. yeah. Oh. Wait, uh, yeah. something's happening here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, back to what I was saying, uh, the reason why, like in judo, <clears throat> like if you throw someone, it's essentially over. And, you know, in BJ, Wait, your they, editors are going to cut these out like the, both times. I. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like when he makes the clips, he'll cut it out. But when yeah, right. like if, if I just upload when I upload the whole uh, because I, I, I like to upload the whole uh, the whole podcast. Yeah. Right. The whole video so that people, if they're interested, they can watch the whole thing. And uh, if and then uh, I'll, I'll cut out cut it up into clips also, and yeah, yeah that's that's no, because like I got up twice and I, I don't oh I don't want to be here. Yeah, okay, just I didn't want to seem uh, you know impolite. Oh no 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 you're not uh, you're not impolite at all. Um, yeah, so back to what I was saying. Uh, yeah, so like for the people who are listening <laughs> in judo, if you throw somebody and it's over. And uh, you might think to yourself, well, why is that? Because, you know, in jujitsu, we would continue, you know, we would continue rolling on the ground and all that. But now if you imagine yourself back in feudal Japan and you're on the battlefield, so there's like, let's say 2000 samurais with swords, you know, and all kinds of weapons and armor. Yeah. And then you have another 2000 on the other side and we're all going to run at each other and we're going to clash and we're going to try and kill each other. Well, here's the thing. Um, if I get, if I throw you on the ground, we're going to clash. And if I throw you on the ground, well, the next step is I'm going to stab you <laughs> or somebody's going to stab you with the yeah, sword. Or if I throw you or um, I kept charging, the guy behind me is going to just stick his sword and can also continue running. Exactly. Exactly. Like I'm going to throw you. And then, you know, my teammate next to me or behind me is going to, Oh, there, there he is. He's right there on the ground, Shock, you know, and just stab you in the neck and you'd be dead, you know? And yeah. of course, uh, if, if, for whatever reason, like I'm able to hold you down. Uh, I think most of the samurais, they didn't just have the, the katana, they had like daggers too. So they could pull out the, the, the dagger and they could stab the person. So that's where it all comes from. That's why the idea that, um, uh, like I'm saying this for, for the viewers, right? That if you throw somebody, it's over because, you know, like on the battlefield in those days, you'd be dead. 
you'd be stabbed and it would be over. So there's no, there's no guard pulling. There's no bearing bolo. There's no, <laughs> you know, and, and that's where yeah. it comes from. And even, even the, um, you know, the bowing in, in, um, you know how, um, I think it's called Seiza, right? Like, you know, when you start a judo class, you go on your knees and then yeah. to get up, it's your right leg that, that your right, uh, your right knee comes up, your right foot yeah. goes up. And the reason for that is because <clears throat> well, on your, usually the, the katana is held on the, uh, on, on the, left. on the left side. So you, if you want to come up off your knees, you have to, you know, come up with your right leg so that you have, you have the sword here. So you could, you could pull it out and, tack, tack, and, you know, at the same, yeah. you could draw your sword at the same time. So that's where it all comes from. Like the idea that, um, you know, like the epon, like if you throw the guy on his back, it's over, you won. If you hold him down, it's, it's, it's done also. So yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to, to, to talk to you about that. And I'm not surprised that you, you know about it, but I was like, Hey, maybe you don't. And maybe, you know, it would be interesting something yeah. you can talk about. Um, also like you don't have to go back that far uh, in the past, like go watch on YouTube, uh, street fight judo, whatever you see a throw and bam, the guy is like sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. It's a dangerous thing. Like I, I saw this one video once, like I'd have to find it again and maybe post it. The on African it. woman. Oh, like no, was... I, I saw that one. I saw that yeah, one. That's so brutal. Like the way she dropped down and bam. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Because even if you don't fall on your back, I, I was actually explaining this to, to a friend of mine the other day. And like, even if, uh, let's say I, I go Ipon Seo Nage, right? Ipon Seo and I drop and I go really low. And even if you don't land on your shoulders, but the thing is that I drop so fast and you don't expect it, your face is going to, you're going to face plant right into the pavement and you're going to be knocked out and you're going to be all, all kinds of messed up. I actually saw that in the octagon. There, I saw this, uh, this compilation, um, like judo throws some, um, there was this one guy that tried to do drop Seonagi, but he actually missed him. So um, he went over to the other side and just like, he ended up just dragging the arm down mm -hmm. without you know, really doing the shoulder throw and you know uh, loading him on his back. And the guy went like flat on his torso and face and it was a KO <laughs> in the yeah. octagon. Oh, okay, in the octagon. Okay, was this yes. in the UFC or like some other organization? I saw it a while back. If I find it again, I'm, like, I'm going to look for it and then send it to you like, because it was like a, a bad serenade like if you do that in judo people are gonna be like are you an orange belt like because he missed him he completely missed him and then just ended up dragging his hand mm -hmm. and landed like torso wise and like on his torso and his tail yeah yeah that's it because it's it's the pavement it's actually very dangerous to do like um because you know and i i made a video regarding this like if you if you do judo like like for in, in, in the streets, you know, because you got into an altercation, man, the yeah. danger is even if you're high level, right? Because in Randori, when you're in your club, like you, we hold each other back. Like we hold the sleeve so that the person lands only on the side so that yeah. you know, it, their, their head doesn't smash to the ground. So they don't get hurt. It lessens the impact. But if you're doing it because you're getting into some kind of uh, argument in the street, most likely you're going to throw with, with, uh, with force, with power. And if you throw hard enough, like, and, and you're in a situation where, you know, you're arguing with the guy, you're, the adrenaline, the, the anger, you're not going to be able to control yourself. And if you smash the guy hard enough on the ground, you're going to get into a lot of trouble because the, the guy might, uh, he might die. He might have brain damage. You might put him in a coma, you know? So yeah. it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a, um, kind of a scary thought when you think about it, you know, because there, there's yeah. like, if you're in a self-defense situation and what happens is that, okay, the guy, like, let's say push you, he punch you and you manage to block and then you throw him so hard that you knock him out. Like, you're still going to have to explain that in court, you know? It's exactly. Not yeah. Yeah. And uh, also like if, if you is not really uh, like a harmful man, it, it's a, probably a disproportional response. So uh, that's why also choice of throws is very important for the street tech. For example, between Teguruma or Squinage and Ochigari, please choose Ochigari. You know? Mm. Yeah, yeah, Ochigari, right? Because like, if you throw a no Soto or, you know, eh, yeah, that's like the, the worst kind of things. And that's why, mm, 
yeah, for self-defense, like, oh, I got to tell you a funny story, but I'm not, I'm not going to mention the name. Okay. Because I don't want yeah. that. I didn't get permission yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a very high level judoka. We're talking like o- Olympic level. Yeah. You know, and, and of course has years and years of experience. And what happens is that um, <clears throat> there was a road rage incident. Oh, and, and, and uh, so there was a road rage incident. So, and then, so he get, he, he, the judoka gets out of his car and then the other gentleman gets out of the car. They start screaming at each other, like in the middle of the street. And then, you know, the, the gentleman pushes uh, the judoka. Okay. And the judoka of course reacts and decks him, punches yeah. him. But I mean, this judoka is strong, really strong. Like he's, you know, like Olympic level athlete. And on yeah. top of that, like, he's just one of those freakily, uh, freakishly natural strength type of, you know, like farmer strength kind of guys. Throws a punch, knocks him out. And the guy was essentially like out cold even before he hit the ground. But after he hit the ground, like he complete, like half his face was completely smashed. And so the, fun, the, the moral of the story is don't get into fights, of course. But the other moral of the story is this is an Olympic level judoka. Yeah. He didn't even, and the, his first instinct was to, to crack the yeah. guy's face. Yeah. It's such, it's the craziest thing. And then when he went to court for this, like, um, uh, you know, there was witnesses and the witnesses ended up saving him because nobody believed that he only hit him once. Wow. Everyone, because his face was so messed up. Like it, like when he got punched, right? He broke like his orbital bone, broke this, broke that. And then the guy landed and it broke some more stuff. So his half of his face was broken, essentially. So nobody believed that he punched him like with just, uh, with just one punch. They thought he just like punched him and then jumped on him and kept on punching and punching until, you know, until the yeah. face got destroyed. So the witnesses there uh, luckily saved them. But then they also asked him the question like, hey, how come, uh, how come you didn't use your judo? Yeah. <laughs> And he said, well, I didn't have time to think. I mean, he pushed me. I thought like I was in danger. So I just punched him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, like that's that's the thing with judo. Other than the choice of throws, it's going to look, especially like, again, don't do like really big pickups because they're going to look very like cringeworthy when you're watching them. So, for example, you know Shintaro Higashi. Yeah, um, yeah, Shintaro. Mm-hmm. He uh, he talked about self defense and also for law enforcement. And he said, like, if, if you see a law enforcement uh, video, it's like when they like now it's very easy to just pull off your phone and yeah. Yeah, um, if you see uh, if you see a law enforcement guy like just punching and swinging at the guy, like the whole world would go insane. But if you see him take him down gently and pinning him and then just negotiating with him and then arresting him. Like that would go far more smoothly, but so again, that's why judo is a um, like a double-edged sword in a sense. Like you have these pickups that can look very badly and reflect very badly on someone, but you also have the choices to do very swift takedowns that you yourself know how to control them, and basically no one gets hurt. But at the same time, you know you show you know who's in control of the situation. So like really clipping someone like not the best, not, that's not going to look very good on you, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly, you know? And, but the thing is like when you're in that situation, I mean, how often do you get into that, a situation like that? So when you do get into a situation like that, like your adrenaline is pumping, your anger, yeah. you know? So like you don't really have time to be thinking, hmm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move, circle, kill his sleeve. Ochi Gary him and then you know knee on belly and hold him down until like it, you can't think straight because you're angry you know when you're angry you can't think that's 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 the problem and I'll tell you another funny story so about another judo oh. <laughs> so this Wait, you judo- said Roy Rage are these judokas taking something hmm? taking something no no just just a very you know uh taking something you mean like alcohol or you mean no I mean you said Roy Rage are they taking something Oh no, road road rage. Oh, I thought you said roid rage. 
oh no no sorry sorry like road rage you know like cars you know people driving cars oh, and yeah, then yeah. Okay, okay. one guy cuts one guy off and then the other guy starts going crazy and they start like yeah. uh, flipping. i live in france there's a there's like a traffic lights every 10 meters so none of that happens there, there's a what there's a, like a stop lights like what do you call them Fou? okay yeah stop you know, lights. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's like a stoplight every 10 meters. So none of that happens. You cannot go that that uh, fast and have a road rage. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I see, I see. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so getting back to uh, this, this other story. So this is another example of, because um, I made a video on how like judo is not really enough for, for, for the streets, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I was coming out of a bar and I was with my, uh, you know, like I was with, couple of my teammates one of them has uh 30 years of judo high level yeah. i think it was uh division one or in in france right yeah. so we go out and uh, we go out at the bar and of course we're walking and we're all a little bit uh tipsy you know from drinking alcohol and then you know we're talking very loud you know we're just making jokes and all that and then we then there was this guy like you know another drunk bastard from another bar and then he comes out, he starts screaming at us and he tells us, Hey, why don't you guys shut the, <laughs> yeah. shut the hell up. You know, you're talking too loud. And then we all looked at him and we're like, okay. And then of course the one with, um, with, uh, 30 years of, uh, of, of judo under his belt looks at him and starts screaming at him. So they both start screaming at, at each other. And then, uh, and then the guy said, yeah, you're lucky when you're with your friends, man, or else like, uh, we, we, you know, we'd throw down. Yeah. And then <laughs> one of my teammates, this guy, this guy was funny. This guy was, so one of my teammates walks up to the guy. He's like, Hey, so you want to go, right? Like you're saying that if we don't get involved, you're going to, you're going to fight. And he's like, yeah, man, no problem. And then, uh, then the, my other teammate comes up and he's like, okay, one-on-one, -on -one, we won't get involved. Go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so me and the two other, two other judokas, we step back and then we wait for like the, you know, like the, the other judoka and this guy who are screaming at each other and who say they want to yeah. go. So we're like, yeah, go fight. So we're standing there <laughs> like in the and middle. What happened? Of, well, actually what happens is that they started, uh, you know, they started like coming closer and 30 years of judo and get, guess what, guess what his first technique was. Uh, a slap in the, like a, a shove. I don't know. Something not really, not judo related. Leg kicks. Just he he leg kicked them into oblivion. He leg kicked them like uh, I think three four times, and then we we're on the sidewalk, and then the guy like he just ate them. He ate the kicks, ate the kicks, and then after that, it was he just ran off into the middle of the street, and then you know then he ran away from there. <laughs> but wait, your friend was uh, somewhat like not fully conscious. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, 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 not at all. Like he was he was tipsy, but I mean he's always tipsy, you know when it. Uh, cause oh likes to go out and drink a lot it's um but what i'm so, saying is like, that yeah, 30 years of saying. judo experience division one like high level he could have easily like just you know like grab yeah, the guy yeah. and throw him or take him down gently or whatever but his instinct was once again to to, to, to hit the guy and then later on i asked him like hey why didn't you we, we kind of made fun of them we're like so 30 years of judo and 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 you threw leg kicks like why didn't you throw the guy and then he said something very interesting he said well Here's the thing, like, I don't know how to box all that well. I don't want to come in and get punched. And on top of that, like, uh, I don't know what kind of disease the guy has possibly, or if he has like some kind of weapon. So the safer yeah. bet for me, the only thing I could come up with at that time was to kick him in the legs. You know, I think boxing is a very interesting martial arts for grapplers. Let me explain. Um, Usually, like from all the fights I've seen in front of my eye, like on the streets outside of the school or something, it always starts with like very strong shoves, then like a big haymaker or a slap, and then you have like a big clinch. And then, you know, maybe like it either ends or like people come in and separate them, like from the stuff that I've seen. But it's usually it's that, se like if you let them go at it, it's usually that sequence is, you know, big shoves. Um, then the slap, like big slaps, haymakers come in. Uh, if they're both still, like if you get a KO, that's it. And then, uh, or if it, it might continue to a clinch, they both maybe tend to fall down. Then whoever gets top position is ground and pound, and that's it. That's like uh, your 
your your street fighter with zero martial background type of sequence from what I've seen. But think about it from the slaps and the shoves till the clinch. That's what a judoka needs to add to his arsenal or to his or her arsenal in order to um, have like after that, then they can use their judo. But then getting in closely and then gripping or uh, not necessarily the best thing. Like even in MMA, you see them, then they throw a few hits and then maybe you know they decided that, okay, that now it's a good time to show my grappling, whether it's Khabib or anyone else. But it's usually it's filling the distance with the striking, then getting closer for the grapple. Like that's the natural sequence of fighting. So that's what we miss in judo. We usually just get in, we grip, and then we start to grapple. Um, I think adding judo, uh, sorry, boxing, or any type of like maybe savat or kickboxing um, for your judo, I think that would complete the sequence. Yeah, yeah. I might be wrong, but that's from my observation. Yeah, I believe the same thing. I believe that you need some kind of um, form of striking. Yeah. Boxing would be would be great. You know, because like you said, like, um, you know, when, when people start off, it would actually be a lot faster when you think about it. Like if you already have a good judo background and then from there you want to learn some striking, um, going into Thai boxing, like it's, it'll take you a little bit longer, you know, to, yeah. to, to master because now you have, uh, you have so many things. You have like your, you have your hands, you have your elbows, you have the clinch, you have the knees, the kicks and yeah. all that. But you could, um, if you were in a hurry uh, to, com- to, to, to complete your, your um, you know, to round off your skill set, then boxing, because boxing hands are, you already have the footwork. You already have a little yeah. bit of, uh, you know, this. Yeah, because of the, the kumikata, you know, you're used to, you know, you have these yeah. reflexes there. So just adding in boxing would be, um, would, would be, you would pick it up relatively quickly. And then from yeah. there, and when you get into a fight, you know, sometimes you're arguing, like, let's say you get into an altercation, like it's very rare that you're thinking, Oh, I'm going to kick him in the head. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, like, so, so, but the first thing that, that your first instinct is going to be to throw, to throw hands. So I yeah. think that that might be a better option, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, the best time to train boxing, like for, for all the judokas who are listening, uh, when you get injured, when you, when you, <laughs> Because injuries is part of 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 yeah, make the best of it by learning boxing. Exactly, because <laughs> let's say you hurt your knee or your ankle, you know, or you uh, you got your shoulder, you know. Well, maybe shoulder is not the best thing, but yeah. if you hurt anything else, like your knees or your lower back or your ankle or whatever, then go do boxing. <clears throat> Especially if yeah. you hurt your knees, because actually one of um one of uh one of the guys that I trained with, one of my teammates, he uh, he hurt himself, he hurt his knee at one point, and then he had to rehab it. So during that time, he couldn't do any judo. So what he did is he went off and he did boxing. So yeah. he, he ended up boxing for like a year, you know, a year or two. And, and now he has like a, he's really solid in boxing. Like I sparred against him and uh, I think he broke my rib or, or not broke my rib, but he did. He, he busted up my right. rib. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, but it was, it, he wasn't going hard. It was just sometimes you, you, you lean into a punch and you weren't protecting yourself properly. And, and it was just kind of like a bad, uh, bad luck, but he messed it up my ribs. But all that to say that his boxing was, yeah. was, good, was very good, you know? So, so the best time to learn boxing would be when you hurt your knee, because uh, that's going to happen for sure. <laughs> yeah, like make the most of your time instead of staying home and getting depressed, that you, you can make uh, good use of it. Yeah, you're right. Or for example, go lift in the gym or you know, do something productive uh, around your injury or active recovery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and it's still, it's still very fun. It's something that's useful and, you know, like you might as well learn it if you're, if you're concerned with uh, self-defense and, you know, I yeah. think anybody who practices martial arts is somewhat concerned with self-defense. Yeah. Or, you know, he doesn't want to be the guy that's easily messed with. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, like at work or between like group of people, like you don't want to be the, like, I, there was this thing, like, this, like, like every like, guy that did martial arts um, growing up, they, they almost had, like, this aura around them, like, oh, he's the boxer. Like, uh, like they, they come, like, they had a little bit of bicep vein, and, like, we didn't lift, mm-hmm. and uh, we were all teenagers, but, like, that's the boxer who goes to the gym, you know? 
they, they ha you have this certain aura because you know discipline uh when you have like or anything else for that matter like you know that's this one is maybe a chess champion something you would know like discipline like i don't know for the good people i would say it really you know at least that's me like when i see someone that's highly disciplined and do something like they autom you automatically respect them like or your level of respect for them goes way 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 up at least that's for me yeah you know it's it's funny that we um that that you should say that because you know how like um if you go into a room and you have um <clears throat> you have athletes you have professional athletes you have uh, famous actors you have famous businessmen and yeah. but if you have the heavyweight champion of the world in a combat sport in boxing for example yeah. everyone's going to gravitate and respect the you know like the yeah. fighter the fighter is the one that gets like all the, you know, like he has that aura about him, like you said, and everybody like kind of, I wouldn't say bow down to him, but they revert him. They're like, oh, this guy, there's yeah. something special, you know, whereas, ah, okay, you're a businessman, you make money, so what? Uh, okay, you, yeah. you throw a basketball around. Yeah, okay, good, you know. Uh, you're an actor. Okay, you're famous and you, you know, you could act. But, oh, you're, you're the guy who, who could literally like, you know, beat the living hell out of everybody in this yeah. room if you wanted to. It's kind of like a primal thing. Somebody talked about this. I forgot where I got this, but they were giving this exact example. And there's something primal about being able to, being that guy in the room that could literally, if you wanted to, dominate everybody else physically. Yeah. And there would be nothing you can do about it. Nothing. You would be like a helpless baby child. You know, so that I also that, explain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Ah, uh, excuse me. Uh, that also explains the um, like the misconception. There's this misconception that you know bodybuilders are very scary fighters, mm -hmm. but uh, for, and those that you know like that like uh, roided up and they're really big. Like I'm talking like IFBB pros type of bodies. Like when they go into the mall or the, I, everyone is like, okay, oh, I'm I, I like then a lot of people. Like their insecurities tends to shoot like way up. Like that guy is not only stronger than me, but they can beat me up. Obviously, now with martial arts, you know that it's not always the case. Uh, but uh, you know, yeah, like as you said, there's this primal thing, um, like the, the stronger guy in the room, or like the tallest, or, or you know, the guy who with the ears, you know, they can fight. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, yeah, it tends to draw this particular it gives a different impression than someone who's a champion in, like, as you said, basketball. Okay, he can dribble, but okay, that's fine. That's not going to affect me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's, there's a little, like, danger to it. You know, there's, like, a little fear. There's a little danger yeah. that you know that there's a potential danger Yeah. there, you know? And then, so that's why people look up. But then, add to, like, for example, if you are the only martial artist in the room, um, or the guy, like, and also the guy that deadlifts the most, and then they see you smiling they see how nice you are they see then you they no longer like fear you but they look up to you and then they they start to like you and love you so i think that's the image that i personally want to project you know the the, the guy that can fight and also very strong but at the same time like when you talk to people and then when you uh, get to know them you would see that oh they're very nice and you know i can feel at ease or safe with them so it's uh, it's you know like as we say we have a responsibility uh, in our community for our families or for our friends and you know it's best that you always show your good side or use these for the better of yourself and other people and that in a, in a sense translates to the philosophy of um, you know mutual welfare of judo mm -hmm. yeah i would say like the jita kyoe the mutual welfare for self and others so it's very good to also not only show your your physical capabilities when you walk into a room but also show your good character with it i think that's very important too you don't want to be feared i would say it's better to be respected and liked than to be respected out of fear i don't i don't i, I know some uh, some like uh, sadists i don't know what you want to call them but they would actually enjoy that very much to be feared and respected yeah. Yeah. I, you know, like I'm, I'm the same way. I, I don't think that um, just because you, 
I, I wouldn't want to be feared. Yeah. Because, but if people are scared of you, like, well, they're not going to, um, um, you know, if people are too scared of you, I mean, that's not a good thing because they'll, they'll, they'll after that, if enough people are scared of you, they're going to set it up so that they'll, they're going to come and take you down because yeah. you just like, uh, because, because they're afraid of you, you know? So I, I don't yeah. like, to, I like, I don't think it's a good thing to project. I mean, I think uh, it depends on the circumstances. I imagine, you yeah. know, if you're in a situation very, you're, it's a very hostile situation, you know, like you're in jail. Okay. Maybe being feared is, is a good thing to a certain extent. Yeah. There has to be some kind of balance there. I think there would have to be some kind of balance between being feared and respected because if you're just a scary guy, that's like, cause you're crazy, then well, people are going to be like, okay, we're tired of this crazy guy. Let's gang up on him and just take him out. Right. Yeah. But if you're feared, but you're respected at the same time, then, okay. That would make more sense in the context of being like in, in, in hostile environment. Uh, but for the most part in everyday life, I don't think I like, I don't want anybody to be afraid of me. You know, I uh-huh. certainly like respect is, would be great, but, um, yeah. And it, it, it goes down to, it comes down to that saying like, uh, uh, speak softly, carry a big stick. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, it's also an illusion, right? Because nobody's invincible. Even if you have that, that aura of, of strength and, and, you know, you could do something and you're a fighter and all that. The truth is like human life is very fragile. Like Uh all you have to do is not breathe for a couple of seconds and you'll be dead. Well, maybe not a couple of seconds, but you know, you're like, yeah, you know, like like, uh, if I cut your air, if I can't cut your oxygen supply, you you die. (laughs) Yeah. As simple as uh, that. Like you just like this. Yeah. No, no, no matter how big you are, you can't live without air. That's how fragile we are as human beings. Yeah, yeah. But um, again, like that ties off with the other misconception, like the the, the strong bodybuilder. But um, it's the same uh, with martial arts. Like, oh, he's like if someone doesn't know martial arts, oh, he's a judo black belt. Like, whoa, stay away. But um, it's again, it's uh, the lack of knowledge of these arts. Now, the more you train, the more you know that you don't know. And the more you know that how, um, you know, easily some, uh, like uh, how easily uh, you can be taken down or how easily you can be hurt. So it's, uh, again, it, these misconceptions tend to come from the part that doesn't know, basically. Yeah. And, you know, even when you do know, like the more you train, the more um, you become humble, in my opinion, of because, because you realize that there's levels to this game. As good as you are, there's somebody better than you, you know, and there's somebody who could take you out. It, it, it doesn't matter who you are. There's always somebody better than you. And even, even though like I've been training now for, you know, uh, in total and grappling for, for like 12 years, but there's still guys out there who've been training longer and, 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 and yeah. they beat me like nothing, you know, and, and it's such a, it's such a humbling experience because, um, you know, like. So that's why I don't even have these thoughts in my mind anymore of like, oh, what a badass I am because I could, you know, I could no. do this, I could do that, or yeah. I won this competition, or I choked out, I did very well in today's, uh, uh, today's Randori sessions, you know, uh, because there's guys out there that, wow, like, you know, you, there's nothing, there's nothing you, I can do against them because they're at such a high level, you know, and, and it's amazing. It's like you roll with this guy, just when you think you're, you're good, then you roll with another one and then he'll completely... Destroy, um, you. destroy you yeah and make you like make you feel like if you're a, a white belt again and yeah it's a constant reminder yeah yeah or like for example sometimes i'd lose so badly i would say i don't even deserve like uh, whatever rank i'm in or sometimes when i pull a technique off and it, com- it comes out complete like bad i think to myself that you know i talk about these techniques all the time on my channel it's like, it's like i feel sometimes that i don't even deserve my audience in a sense and I'm like, you need so much learning and so much studying. Like, just, you know, like it keeps you grounded in a sense. Like, obviously, sometimes we go hard on ourselves, like, oh, I'm a white belt. Um, but it's like, as you said, it's a constant reminder, but uh, you know, don't go too hard on yourself. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. If you don't pull off Uchimata or Uchiyari and Randori because the guy is far more experienced than you, don't, don't think, you know, because you, you don't know how to do it. He's, 
far more experienced and he saw it coming from way back. So when you pull it off like two days ago, that means you are somewhat good, you know, against someone your own level, or maybe even a little bit higher grade, but that guy was like way off. So don't go too hard on yourself, but just so you know that you still have way more to learn. It's, it's a never ending process. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's, it, it doesn't mean that you don't know how to do the technique or you can't execute it. It's just that the other guy saw it yeah. coming and you weren't able or to block your gripping way too good. Hmm? Or like, um, like I remember I, I couldn't get a hold of the sleeve. He had my sleeve and also like the, I couldn't snap the, the lapel. I, and it was at all, I was just attacking out of desperation basically. And everything came out just so terribly because I couldn't stand and do nothing. I had no grips because he's just gonna destroy me. I was just attacking out of desperation and all my techniques came out horribly. And I remember coming back home and I was thinking, man, I should just stop everything because I, I talk about these techniques all the time and I, I can barely execute them. And so I started having these like this very bad cycle in my head. And then I was like, just relax. He was heavier. He's it was, he's been doing judo for before you were born, like just relax, calm down. You know, it, it happens. So don't get too discouraged, but just learn that you still have more, you know, to study. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it's important to um, <clears throat> like to put things into context, to rationalize things, and yeah. and also to train with with um, with lower belts a lot. Because I'd and say a healthy mix of both. A healthy mix of both. Yeah, a healthy mix of both. Because the thing is. Um, if you constantly train with people who are much more advanced than you, then you're going to feel like you're going nowhere. And yeah. then you'll always be in defensive mode. You'll always be in a desperate situation where you're just trying to attack and you can't practice anything that you want to practice because you're just in pure fight mode because you can't do yeah. anything. So you yeah. don't learn, you don't, you don't necessarily get too much out of that. But then when you, when you, when you, when you train with people who are uh, at your skill level or who are a little bit less advanced, then you can start working on your techniques and refining yeah. things and putting yourself I, in bad situations and so on and so on. And um, like me, I remember, oh, one of the things that we used to do that we do at my club is that um, towards the end, you know, if there's a lot of people, our, uh, uh, my coach is going to separate the groups. <laughs> so yeah. he's going to be like, okay, Hong, you go with this person, this person, this, that's your corner. You guys fight together. Okay. And then you guys, you guys are heavier. You guys are going to go there. And I used to always want to go with the, uh, the black belts. Bigger guys. The, yeah. Or the bigger you know, guys. Yeah. Because in my mind, I was like, I'm going to benefit more. I'm going to put, you know, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to get a workout. I'm going to learn a lot and all that. Uh, and then at one point I realized that all I'm learning is uh, all I'm working on, all, all I'm improving on is, uh, uh, you know, falling, <laughs> my falling skills and getting up. <laughs> like and not giving up and being or getting countered <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was this one time where it was um it was basically uh king of the mountain um so the winner stays so oh, winner, yeah i love that so, so the winner stays and i was put with uh five other guys five six other guys and they were all black belts and all of them were on the national team yeah you know Hong and, was eliminated the first one hmm Hong and, and was the first guy to go out. I'm, I'm the brown belt. So the thing, and it was also the coach. So he's a two-time Olympian. Yeah. And then you have all the yeah. national team members. <laughs> and they're all heavier oh. than me. And one of the guys was lighter, but I mean, he's also like, he was also on the national team and all that. So the thing is, I come in first round, I get taken out in like two seconds. Oh, man. And then I'm sitting, so I have to wait my turn. So there's like, like four or five other guys before me. So I got to wait my turn, but these guys, when they're fighting, because they're, they're, they're highly skilled and they're, they're more or less evenly matched, it takes time. It takes them like two, three minutes before they get an epon. And then, so I have to wait for, I have to wait like 10, 15 minutes to get another round in. And that by, by that time I get my second round and I'm out in like 10 seconds again. Oh man. So I'm yeah. sitting there, I'm, I'm getting discouraged because I'm thinking to myself, I can't even practice <laughs> I, I, cause yeah. I can't last. I can't, I can't, I can't take any of these guys down. So I never stay in the middle. So it's King of the mountain. So I'm always out. Yeah. And then I got to wait like another 10 minutes. So this is like absolutely useless, you know? And I think my, my, um, my coach noticed that, that I wasn't getting practice and, 
I was lighter than everybody. So he started putting me with, um, uh, you know, guys who were more that were about my size or lighter, but who were less experienced. So then at least I could, I could, uh, I could roll more and, and have more and more practice and I could develop my skills. So now when I look at the, when I look, when he divides the group, I'm actually happy that I'm with the guys like at my level or a little bit lower so I could actually practice. Yeah. Um, my experience is like the two groups um, that are above your rank that can teach you are two. Uh, first one is advanced women because um, they can rely more on technique. They can rely more on technique. And at the same time, they're not going to give you a very hard time because they're not going to be as strong as you are. So you can mentally let go of the strength aspect and really work on your moving. And they're going to be doing that to you because they're going to keep moving. They're going to see you as a man, even though you're uh, ranked below them or whatever, they're going to keep moving you and you're going to do the same. And back in your head, you're going to be like, I'm all technique because I don't need to use strength or force my technique. So that can teach you a lot about your technique how you do it, how you angle yourself, et cetera. And at the same time, they're not going to give you an easy time because as I said, they're advanced. Even though they're a woman, they're going to be advanced and they're going to give you a hard time. But at the same time, you can know if you are using strength or at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm really crafting my technique. So you can go for an ifon. You can get something done and learn something about yourself. And they can also teach you. They can tell you like, hey, you know, do this, do that, or... Or try using the sleeve in this way. They they have something to tell you, um, but uh, in terms of like strength aspect, uh, etc., they can uh, they can show you they can really tell you a lot about yourself. And the second uh, uh, group that can teach you is the old veterans. You know they beat up their bodies. They know their bodies. Um, they're not going to use strength as well because they they are far more about energy efficiency. Um, you can you know, move with them like uh, an advanced woman. And at the same time, they have a lot to show you and teach you because they don't care about competition. They're not there to train for competition. They competed. And at the same time, they have a lot of, they have decades of wisdom to tell you. I'd say these are the two groups that I've learned most from. You know, that's, that's, that makes a lot of sense. That's very invaluable because I'm thinking about it now. Um, and I've had experience uh, uh, sparring with, uh, women who are <clears throat> much, who were on the national team. Yeah. And of course, like, because they're women and because I'm, I'm able to control myself, I'm not going to use strength. You know, I'm going to use pure technique to try to out outmaneuver them <clears throat> and yeah. outgrip them and, and so on. And even in my, in my gripping exchange, I'm not going to use too much strength, you know, like I, I gauge it so that it's, it's, it's more or less even. And what I've noticed is that, um, because I don't have to worry, like you said, about, you know, like getting, uh, about the strength aspect of it. I know she's not going to dominate me in strength, so I can kind of let loose and really focus on technique and try to figure things out. And it, it's, it's crazy because I remember after, um, after fighting with, uh, those more advanced, uh, uh, women who are, you know, black belt national team and all that, I realized that, oh man, like if we were the same size, they would have, they would have whipped my ass big time. But I was able to manage a little bit more because, uh, you know, because I have a little bit more strength, you know, so I could kind of resist some of their attacks, even though I wasn't really trying to resist all that much, but I was still able to get away with stuff because of my, you know, just because I'm, I'm a little bit bigger and stronger. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a good point right there. But the veterans, I could see that being beneficial too. like um, veterans who they're not out to just smash you, you know, and they're a little bit, um, they're more about timing, technique. And they could guide you along the way. They could kind of correct you while you're, uh, while yeah. you're doing things. They don't care. They don't have competition. Like, for example, I went, uh, we, here we have what is called the uh, Institute uh, Judo or Judo Institute. Um, it's usually like a big open space. And it's like high level, high, 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 highest level. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to spar with you. Like, they have competition. So they see you a colored belt. They're, gonna, they're not going to even look at you. So uh, if you do this, no one's going to come to you. No one. So who's going to come and say, hey, let's train? It's the veterans. So it's the, the pace is very easy going. Uh, they're going to they're gonna counter you and they're going to fall down quite a few times because, again, 
they're gonna beat you with experience, but um, the pace is very good for your level. Um, you can learn to let loose. Um, you can train your technique and they will give you a lot of good pointers. Yeah, and I think you actually advance better that way because if you always train with people who are gonna smash you into oblivion, what are you really learning? You know, you're no. learning absolutely nothing. You know, you learn- get discouraged. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you get discouraged too. And there's no fun in that. And of course, you're, you know, like you're taking damage, like, like it or not. Like the fact of falling all the time, like when you're young, it's fine. But me, like I have, um, I have like shoulder issues, knee issues now and lower back issues uh, because of judo and because of BJJ also. But I mean, judo is, it's, a, it's another level of, of, um, of injuries. And all that to say that it, if you get thrown all the time, like it gets, uh, not only does it get demoralizing and you don't learn anything, but your body's taking a beating and, and th- there's wear and tear in your joints because of that. So you're better off sometimes, like you said, just training with the veterans, training with yeah. women who are more advanced. I think that's actually a very smart approach for people who are um, starting judo later in life. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, we have in my club, we have like the competition uh, group, which is like high, high level, like uh, first division, even Grand Prix, Grand Slam. Ooh. And we have the uh, recreational, which is like the half of them is black belts in their 40s. They have families. They don't care. They just do two, judo two times a week. They just come in and have fun. And I learned from them way more and you become friends with them way easier. You know, it's a funny thing because here, you know, when you go to, um, um, if you go to the, na- the national center, like the, uh, here is called the INS. So that's like where the EG, hmm? like the, the Institute. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like if you're a brown belt, you're allowed to go there on, I think it's, it's, it's Thursdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays for, for sparring. I think it's Thursdays. But if you go there, it's all the national team guys. <clears throat> you're allowed to be there. But it's exactly like you said, if you go like this, when it's time, no one's they're you know, they're not going to, they're going to ignore you essentially, because to them, you're like a waste of time. Yeah. Like you're literally a waste of time because then they're, uh, you know, it's, I'm not, um, I could understand where they're coming from. Do I agree with it a hundred percent? Not really, you know, but, uh, but I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to get on the national team. They're competing for in, they're trying to improve themselves. So to them, like, you know, going with you, who's not uh, a prospect or somebody they're going to compete against or whatever, then it's, you know, so yeah. And these guys, they, they totally ignore you. It's, it's crazy the way it works, but they don't, um, you could ask anybody. And, and usually, like you said, the ones that are actually like take you on will be like the veterans. Yeah. And this is not from my own experience, but this is from people who've been there and uh, who've told me what it's all about. They're like, cause you know, I asked them, I remember asking my coach, yeah, should we go to the national center? He's like, honestly, no one's going to want to spar with you. You know, even he said, even me, they don't want to spar with me. You know, some of them do, but you know, most people, yeah. you know, and they all look at you funny too. So it's kind of like weird. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not a nice feeling. Uh, but uh, unfor- unfortunately, when I went there, like there was a lot of uh, veterans and they were very, very nice. And uh like I'm, I, I'm thinking like when things go back to normal, I would go there to spar with the veterans. Like that would be very good also. You know, you know it's not just like the, the five, six guys that you constantly spar with in the club, but also like go in, you would see veterans that you've never met. They would also have, you know, the surprise element. And also, you know, you would change, you know, your, whatever you're doing, like uh, have something new in the mix. And uh, it's 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 fun it's always fun to go to open mats you know what it's what's interesting about the veterans like the older guys that that have been in a long time is like now they have to rely a lot more on technique and timing yeah strategy so you could learn so much from these guys because they're they're not they're not going to smash you with strength or speed or you know like yeah they'll explode into their technique but i mean it's not it's not the same thing as a a young guy who's still coming up and coming yeah and here's a funny story yeah, uh, you were saying sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, please. Uh, I was sparring with this veteran, and uh, I knew in the back of my head that there's no need for technique. I was really like moving him and then striking and taking him down. I took him down for like three times, and I was feeling 
really, really like good about myself. And uh, he was like, it's good. Like which judo club you're from? And I told him, uh, and then like, wow, that's a very good club. Uh, like, it's one of the best here. And, uh, and then we continued. I took him down like a couple of times, uh, moving him around. And then uh, towards the end, he just gripped me like this. Bam, Ippon Saranagi. Like he was really going easy on me. But at the same time, I got to practice really easy going technique. And he complimented my judo. So um, it's really, um, like I said, it's very important. Uh, they're going to let you do it. You, you use more technique. And all the other veterans that I've trained with, all their ippons scored on me was actually me going for something, and then they would just counter me like that. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys are. It's interesting, and it, it's it's, and there's no there's no ego with them, you know. Yeah, that's they're always smiling. It's amazing. Yeah, it's because they're they're more in it for like the uh, the social aspect, the culture, you know, yeah. the things that they have in common. So so it's it's more about that than it is about like ferocious competition to be number one yeah and you know a, another funny story too i remember I, when i went to the ins which is the equivalent of um of of of, of you know the, the mm -hmm. yeah yeah of the national center there in, in, in france and it was it was a funny thing so there was this uh this veteran judoka so we start randori and he just stands there with his hands like to his side and he just yeah. waited for me to, to, to try and come and grab him. And then once I grab him, you know, he, he, then, then he, 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 he bends his legs a bit and he lowers his, cent, his center of gravity a little bit. But then when I grab him, that's when he grabs, he gets his grip. And then he waits for me to move. And then, poof, Ashibarai, yeah. clack. And it's the worst feeling ever. But it's so it's impressive at the same time. It's, it, yeah. To me, it's the ultimate. It's like a Ashibarai, like when it's well done. You know what? Uh, uh, for those of uh, who, for those who are listening and who don't know what that is, it's a foot sweep. When they sweep you and they sweep you hard and fast, and you fall like a sack of potatoes, like right on the ground. To me, it's the that most can be dangerous. On um, I would say, if it's outside, that can be dangerous. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. And it's such a, it's like a, to me, it's so, it's like a slap in the face. It's so insulting, and it's so yeah. like I feel so ashamed when I get caught with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, yeah, so that's that was his style. And he did that to me the whole time. He was just waiting for me to grab. And I was like, yeah. what? what's going on? So that's when I realized there's like, uh, and I talked to my coach at the time about it. And he was like, well, there's two types of judos. <laughs> you know, there's there's the uh, the strength-based judo that you see at the Olympics, which is relies on athleticism, strength, aggression, you know, and of course there's technique and all that. But then there's the whole, there's another side of judo where it's all about timing. You know, it's timing and pure technique. And it's a beautiful thing. And uh, yeah, that's what I, I, I experienced with, with that gentleman. He just sweeped me the whole time. And it was, yeah. it, was uh, it, it was something. It was really impressive. Yeah, same thing happened to me. Or they would like hook your leg. The moment you take it, they sweep it. Um, it's uh, it's very yeah I remember it's very embarrassing. He took me down like three four times like that, and uh, he had like a like all white hair, but he was just so dominant. But he was always smiling and like like that's the judo goal for me. Mm -hmm. That's where I want to be, and uh, I think uh, like also that's one other thing. He's Jigoro Kano himself said that if you want to see real judo, go watch the women. Like, that's why I said advanced women can teach you a lot because not only they would tell you things about you, like, okay, I don't, I'm, uh, I'm using too much strength or not no strength at all. Or, um, you know, the reason why it didn't work because I was so stiff with the other guy because he was just so much stronger than me. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, like, you don't even feel it. You get very stiff. And a lot of people tell me this, especially in the beginning. Like, you were way too stiff. I would get a shido in competition. I'm like, what, what the hell happened? It's like, <laughs> You were way too stretched out your hand, but I, like sometimes you don't see yourself doing things. That's that's why I, I'm gonna say this again for the viewers: tape yourself always, or you know, constantly see yourself where you are. It's very important because you might think you have an upright posture, but completely completely bent over. You might think you have a very bendable arms, but they're actually really stretched out. Or you can have your butt backwards completely. You know, like. The worst stance you can have while you think you have a very normal stance so it's very important to take yourself 
Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And and the the thing is, like, you you'll eventually get it, but it might take you a lot longer, uh, for sure. It and you could you could cut the learning curve if you actually film yourself and watch tape. Yeah. And you know, like the funny thing is, there was um, I forgot where I read this, but you ever heard of the ten thousand hour um, uh, rule? No. Where if you spend, uh, I think the the author of that book is called Malcolm Gladwell. I don't yeah. know if he invented that or he researched it, but there's something where they say that if you spend 10,000 10, hours doing something, that's when you become an expert. Mm. Like that's, and usually 10,000 hours translates to about 10 years of practice. Right. Now, the thing is, and there was another study I read somewhere else where they were saying how if you take two guys and then both of them have 10,000 10, hours of practice, yeah. Right. And one of them is going to be elite. They, they gave an example. One of them was elite and the other one was just good. They said, how come they both have 10,000 hours of practice. And then when they dive deeper into that, they realized that one guy did 10,000 hours of, let's say, uh, actual practice and the other, so half, no, sorry, 5,000 hours of actual practice. And the other 5,000 was reviewing tape and studying. Oh. So he was the one who was elite as opposed to the guy who just did 10,000 hours of practice. So right. when you think about that, watching tape would be the equivalent of, um, you know, like the, do it, like the guy who's elite in the sense that like, if you just go, it's not enough to just show up to your club every day and practice and practice and practice and practice and, and you think you're getting better and you probably are, but you're not going to get as good as you could have if you actually slow down, tape yourself and take the time to watch it because that's actually a part of your training. Like I realized that now I'm like, well, you know, visualization training, like you don't have to train two, three times a day. You could train one time a day and then spend like an hour or two hours just watching tape and studying yourself and studying other judokas. And when you come back, your practice is even going to be more profound than yeah. if you were just to practice two times a day. So I agree. I agree. Uh, I, like I said, that there was something that I was like, you need to watch yourself from the outside. That's very important. Because when you're in Randori, you're in it. You, don't, you cannot see the whole picture. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, like, um, that's why from now on, like, filming is such an important thing. And, you know, yeah. you got to bring your phone or your camera and get your get a good buy a very cheap tripod and you're good yeah yeah or or not even a tripod like what what i did <laughs> was that i would i would talk to like uh let's say i was with my you know the group of people there with my teammates and i would ask one of them hey um uh can you help me film this fight and after that like i'll, I'll film yours afterwards so they would take my phone and then of course yeah. i you know I, they would film my fight and after that when they would uh when the fight would be over <laughs> I would film them or I would ask somebody else, but I, I would always get the guy who's resting. Yeah, that's good. You know, and, and, and that's it. And I, I would tell them, Hey, I'll, and I'll film yours too, if you want, you know, and I'll send it to you, you know, so that way, like they could have, cause who doesn't want to have footage of themselves fighting. Right. It's kind of yeah. a good souvenir, a cool thing to have, you know, and if you want to post it online, post it online, fine. But um, so that's what I do. I just get somebody who's relaxing to, to film it. And um you know, and if you don't have anyone, tripod is the next, uh, uh, Best thing. yeah. Or if you have a tripod, like, let's say you have a tripod with a camera and then you take your phone and you give it to another guy. So you could have actually two angles. So that would be pretty oh, interesting. Man. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you scored an Ippon, you would see it like maybe from this side and then maybe like your back is to the camera. Yeah. That's actually good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's, uh, I think that I would, I would want to have like um, both approaches because I, I still, I still plan on competing and I'd like to win a world title, like in my division, right. My age, yeah. division. so I'm 42. It's going to be masters three, four or five. By the time I, there, so, there's veterans, uh, competition. Yeah. That's good. Like you see them in their white beards and stuff. I don't know if it's, there's age uh, categories as well, but, or if it's just veteran, because here veteran is 35 and up. So I'm not sure if it's a 35 can go up against a 55 year old to me that that's not very 
it's not, it shouldn't be a thing. It, there should be age categories. But yeah, you can always go for something in judo. Like even if you very love, if you love etiquette and traditionalism, you can go for kata competition even. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, here in here in Canada, where I'm at, like they have um, they have M1, so that's starting at uh, 30 years old. Then when you're 35, then you're uh, Masters two, and then when you're 40 up to you know 44, for example, that's Masters three. So there's like there's oh, okay. categories. Yeah, that's, I agree with that. That's yeah. So there's categories yeah. within veterans, you know. Yeah, like because like a 30 year old man is. Like you can go to the Olympics compared to a 50 year old man. Exactly. Exactly. So like my, my goal is to win uh, a world title in the next five years. So right now I'm trying to map out my, my, my training, my progression and everything I need to do to, to win that title. And yeah. I think that one, one thing that's going to help me is to, because I'm still able to train with the, the seniors, you know, like the, the 20 year olds. Yeah. I'm not of course winning or beating them. Um, you know, I might give them a hard time once in a blue moon, but I train yeah. with them. And if I train with, uh, other veterans as well, who are a little bit more technical and more on the timing aspect of it, I think yeah. that's, and that's, that's, what's going to help me get to my goal and win in competition. Because if I have both sides, of, um, if I have the time, if I develop the timing and the technique and I still, I'm still able to, to maintain my, my strength and athleticism, and the aggression part of it, then I think I'm going to have a good chance against um, people in my division. I yeah. think I'm not sure because I don't know how how these guys are. I have to. Uh, the plan yeah. is to compete when everything opens up again to start competing regularly, and then after that, going to a um, uh, a world uh, you know uh, international tournament yeah. like a world championship for veterans for masters, and then see what happens from there, and then see where I'm at to kind of assess like where my level is you know, like where am I, um, in regards to everybody else that's competing in that division. And then yeah. after that, however I perform, then I go back to the drawing board and then I prepare for the next year. And then from there, I try very, to do better. Very, yeah. It can be a bit tricky because I, I remember once in one in your, uh, you said something in your videos, mm -hmm. um, you said something about like, yeah, you can go compete in masters, but that guy can be like a former Olympian or a former, uh, like who used to compete in Grand Prix and Grand Slam that can come up against you. So it's not, they're not going to be all like you. Uh, um, you know, they started late and then they, you know, made their way up to that high level. So it can be a bit tricky. So, but I think with what you're doing in terms of, uh, you know, uh, strength training and, uh, you know, flexibility, longevity, all that stuff that you do on the side with your like fitness, I think that's going to help you a lot. I think you're doing a great job. Mm, okay. I don't know your judo, like your height, your weight, but I think with the fitness stuff, like I see with the exercises, preserve your, your shoulders, your knees, it says, I think that's very great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And that's the whole idea, right? Because I, I have to preserve <clears throat> what I have and even improve yeah. on it. That's why like I'm, I'm working. It's a funny thing, but I, I have a sports doctor <clears throat> that's, uh, that I got assigned uh, to me by my family doctor. And then from there, I got my sports doctor to hop on board with my project. So, you know, I told her, listen, this is the plan. Five years, I want to be a world champion in my division. I got to keep yeah. the body intact. And she told me, well, listen, if you want to do that, you're going to need a bubble. You're going to need a bubble that you could trust. So a bubble meaning a group of people who, will, who, who are there for you to take care of you and to, to guide you through the whole uh, process. So you're going to need a judo coach, which I have already. You're going to need a sports medicine doctor that you could always go see when, uh, you know, issues arise and you're going to need like, a, an osteo and a physio and possibly a masseuse. Yeah. So we found an osteo. Um, so I'm, I went to go see my osteo now and we're working on some stuff and yeah, we're going to see what happens, but that's the plan. So I had to have this, uh, team of health professionals to surround yeah. me so that that way I can keep my body intact long enough because I think that sometimes I, I'm thinking that if I could keep myself, my, my body physically intact and strong, I'm going to have an advantage over the guys who don't approach this the same way mm -hmm. in competition, you know, because, you know, at, at 40 something years old, guys have a lot of injuries. They might not have as much cardio. They much, they might not have enough 
as much flexibility. So me, I, I don't really care how I win it in the sense that like, if I show up there and there's five guys and I beat two of them and I'm world champion, I'll still take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about nutritionists? Do you have one or? Uh, nutritionist? No, no, actually I don't have a nutritionist. Like I, you know, I have some knowledge in, in, in regards to, to, uh, how to eat properly, but I mean, it's not my, uh, super specialty. Like I know, obviously I know how to eat to, to stay lean, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I know like, uh, I'm pretty advanced to help your average Joe, but to help somebody like myself, then I'm going to have to probably get help at one point. And because, yeah. you know, there's, there's only so much time in a day. I can't like spend five hours a day reading up on stuff. And experimenting sometimes it's better to just to pay somebody to you know to yeah. uh, tell you what you do. this is uh i that regarding nutrition this is something that's uh like i've been way too much before the judo thing and like it, it's every like discipline is different but um when i think of nutrition it's um i always see it from like the bodybuilding a point of view and that's not necessarily healthy because they do so much like yo-yoing and bulking and cutting and but if you were to give like for me and my audience and like or your audience my audience everyone um how like the like i would say like the big picture for judo nutrition how in, my, in your opinion like to stay lean and also um uh, you know around the weight that you compete and also uh, gives you energy. Like for example, I would never, like from my experience, I would never go zero carb or keto in something as explosive as judo, for example. Like bodybuilders can do that all they want, but in a as like a like a judo format, I would never go with that. Like, how? What do you have to say nutrition-wise for you know all the people that are practicing judo? Oh, okay, okay. So let's um. There's a lot of like aspects to that. So we'll touch on weight, right? If, um, if you, if you have weight to lose, like the truth is like for you to know what your, um, uh, your actual weight is, get an uh, accurate picture of your, uh, how much you actually weigh now. You gotta, you gotta take your weight every single day under the same circumstances. So for example, you wake up in the morning, you take your weight. Or yeah. you wake up in the morning, you go to the washroom, then you take your weight. So you have to do the same thing every day. So once you take your weight from Monday to Sunday, so that's seven days, then you add it all up and you average it up. So then that's going to give you your average weight. Right. And that's a more accurate representation of how much you actually weigh now. Because the thing is, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, your weight fluctuates depending on how much food and how much water you have in your body. So if yeah. you take your weight in the morning and you take your weight in the afternoon or in the evening, it's going to change. It's not going to make sense. And even from day to day, your weight is going to, is going to change. So for example, yeah. if you, if you're competing or you, uh, and you want to be at a certain, um, uh, you want to be in a certain weight class, normally you want to be ideally in the, um, in the higher, uh, range of your weight class. So depending yeah. on what that is, let's say you're, so if you want to, and, and for your competition, I think that one thing that you have to take into consideration is, are you cutting weight or not? You know, do you, do you have to cut down or not? And how much can you possibly cut? You know, like if, so if you want to lose weight, you have to take a average of week one, and then you have to compare it with average of week two. And uh -huh. if your weight is not going down, right from week one to week two, if it's not going down, then that just means you weren't in a caloric deficit. If it stays the right. same, it means you're eating at maintenance, uh, maintenance level in terms of your calories. If you're putting on weight, it means that obviously you are in a, uh, uh surplus. surplus. Right. So that's the important thing. You have to track your weight. And then from there, um, when it comes to dieting, you, you don't want to diet too hard to go down. Like, let's say you want to go down in weight. You have to, you have to be, um, systematic about it. So the rule of thumb is 1%. You don't want to lose more than 1% of your body weight in pounds per, per, per week. Because if you, if you do that, it means that you're going down too fast. So you're kind of starving yourself. If you're yeah. starving yourself, then you're losing muscle mass. 
So you oh. don't want to lose muscle mass because, you know, muscle is, uh, it's hard to build for one. And it's, uh, it's metabolic. It's important, like for you to have all that it's, it's functional. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good for performance, right. To have muscle. Yeah. So you don't want to go down, down too fast. So if you were to create a deficit, uh, a deficit on a daily basis, you want to, you don't want to create it just through food. So you want to, for example, if you want a 500 calorie deficit a day, because a pound of fat is 3,500 calories. Yeah. So if you wanted to um, lose a pound of fat, then at the end of the week, you want to have a deficit of 3,500 calories. So if you were to create a 500 calorie deficit a day, after seven days, that would be 3,500 calories. The problem with 500 calories is that that's a lot. <laughs> That's like a yeah. whole, that's practically a whole meal. So how would yeah. you do that? Well, you would do it half, half. You would um, eat, let's say, for example, 200 calories less, which is very doable. But burn more. I could go, uh, uh, yeah. And, you know, let's say 250 calories, you, you eat 250 calories less, but then you go burn off 250 calories. All right. Through exercise. So that's uh, a much better way of doing it. You know, yeah, of much course, because mm -hmm. like walking 200 calories is very feasible. Exactly, exactly. And the thing is, um, and the way you eat, I always preach a balanced diet, <laughs> you know, so you want to have your proteins, your carbs, and of course, uh, your, your, your fats. fats, eat a lot of veggies. It's very good for your body and all that. And of course, resting is important. I think, I think that if you go, um, the more, if you eat processed foods, like, cause it doesn't matter how often you eat in a day, you know, yeah. like, uh, I think it's better to, to everybody's different, but I, it's better to spread it out. I feel so that your energy levels are stable, you know, at least yeah. like, let's say once in the morning or afternoon. And then, you know, uh, sometime in the evening, you know, two, three meals, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. It's how many calories you consumed in that day that, that, that matters. Wait, uh, one last question. I know I'm, I'm, I'm taking uh, valuable knowledge from personal trainer, but, excuse, but this, is, this is another thing because you know, I said bulking and cutting and uh, they say you should not be shredded. You run, not, not necessarily shredded, but like very lean. You know, and judokas are very lean, like especially the highest, at the highest level. But so uh, let's say you got cut and you have, your visible abs and you're lean and you're you look really good and at the same time you feel very good because you don't have that excess weight on your midsection as a man i'm talking mm -hmm. um let's just say you cut it and then so what do you do from then to stay lean you just eat at maintenance because uh it's gonna keep getting down what you, you cannot eventually starve yourself so you can stay at maintenance to keep this particular look or this particular weight so what do you do do you cycle your maintenance like how do you do it Oh, well, like if you're, if you gotten down, so first off, like, um, nine to 12% body fat is athletic range. Yeah. So for athletic performance, nine to 12. If right. you want to see like clear, like clear cut abs, like the whole six pack under any lighting, any, you know, uh, even in the dark, you can see it. It's 10% body fat. Yeah. 9% is. And so it's between nine and 12 at 12%. You're seeing like a four pack for sure. Yeah. So between nine, nine and 12%, it's fine for most athletes. Like, so you, you could be lean year round. Now, once you get to, let's say, for example, if you're at, down at, um, to, to 12%, 10% or 9% and you're feeling good, you're feeling strong. You don't have that X because fat, that's what it you're is. You're not hungry. That's the point Like you don't feel like oh, I'm, I'm so hungry. Exactly. You don't want that. You want, you don't want to be hungry and you don't want to feel tired. Like that's, that's yeah. where people go wrong when it comes to dieting. So from there, you just uh, eat at maintenance. You don't, you don't need, but once again, you have to track your weight. If you track your weight every, you, you, you track your weight on a weekly basis, right? So you take the average every week and yeah. you compare it. If you're in the, if, if you're not losing weight, then you're at maintenance. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's very good. So you should like every morning, it should be a habit to actually see your weight. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Write it down on, you know, like a piece of paper or something, you know, you wake up, take your weight, boom. Then that, that way, you know, like, let's say for example, if right now you have a six pack and you're like, okay, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to keep cutting because, you know, I already have my six pack. I'm happy where I am. I feel good. So there's no point in going lower because, you yeah. know, if you drop below, um, if you drop below, like 
9%, for example, okay, then you're going to start, you won't feel as strong, you know, like, cause now you're just too lean. Like your body does need a little bit of fat, right? Yeah. So, but uh, between nine and 12, you're fine. Uh, that's, that's like really, that's athletic. And from there, you want to maintain what you have right now, then just keep taking your weight and then just making sure that you, you stay around that weight every single week. If you go up, you're in a surplus. If you go down, you're in a deficit. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, because like they say, you know, if you, you're that shredded now and then you, you want to keep that and then your metabolic rate drops and then you have to go down even more and then you eventually end up eating 1200 calories like a, like a teenage girl and then it's not healthy. And so it's just have to like find your ideal weight or where you look good, you feel good. Mm -hmm. Then you just uh, track it every single day and then make sure it stays there. That's basically it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And of course, you go how you go with how you feel because you're saying that. Uh, but what do you mean exactly by like when they said uh, your meta metabolic rate goes down? You mean that your metabolism is going to slow down? Is that it? Or yeah, exactly. Well, as long as you're lifting weights and you're you're doing resistance training and you know like you're you're eating enough protein, then you're going to maintain your muscle mass. Right. But if you maintain your muscle mass, your meta metabolism isn't going to isn't going to go down. It's only when you lose muscle. Because the problem with people who bulk and cut is that when they're bulking, they're just getting fat. Because, and then when they're cutting, they're cutting so drastically, you know, like they're, they're not giving themselves enough time to, to, to cut down to the weight they're supposed to be. So they're starving themselves and they're losing muscle. And if you lose muscle, your metabolism goes down. Right. I see. So, so, so it's that's best to really have a healthy balance. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, like, you don't need to, and, and the thing with bulking is that, People are think they're getting big, but you're, you're actually just getting fat. Or storing water. Yeah, it's fat, water, glycogen. So you're all like this, but like, okay, it's, you know, and, and you are stronger, yes. And part of it is actually because your range of motion is shorter <laughs> on the bench. Yeah, and also you're eating more to really go at it. Yeah, and you're yeah, filled up with water, which is going to really help fill up the muscles and you're going to be strong. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But you're actually, you know, like you're actually not building all that much more muscle because um, muscle takes time to develop. It's right. not, it's like a physiological process of like your muscles have to be broken down and built back up. I mean, that yeah. doesn't happen in, in, that doesn't happen very fast. You know, like there's. You know, a, I, yeah, I think, uh, you know what, what we really need now in like, I, I can only speak for judo, but I think with what you're doing with the like personal training and fitness and your knowledge of nutrition, I think it's very important because everything else we like when it comes, whatever discipline we're doing, uh, unless like we can afford very good nutritionists, et cetera, but not all of us can. I think it's very important to make uh, like a blueprint at least for nutrition when it comes to judo, because everything else, um, you know, whatever we are doing and we want to talk about nutrition for some reason and it's so wrong in my opinion we go to the bodybuilding uh like coaches and bodybuilding mindset and it's just so wrong and can be very unhealthy to some and it can develop eating disorders but if you do it from a healthy balanced way or dedicated for judo i think it's best and uh think uh i would i really wish you can come out with some like a blueprint for us judokas regarding nutrition Maybe an ebook, maybe a series of videos, something. And that that would be really great. I think a lot of us would appreciate it, especially competitive ones. Yeah, yeah, you know that's a, that's a good idea. I think that now that you, um, um, you know, you you mentioned it, and that you you think that it would it, it would it would be something that would be beneficial for uh, for athletes for judokas more specifically. Um, yeah, I think I'll. I'll look into that and I'll, I'll figure out a way to do it. Either some kind of ebook or some kind of uh, video series, you know, to uh, benefit everybody. Because that's the thing, right? Like even when you're, you're an athlete, it doesn't mean you know how to eat. Sometimes it's just because you listen to your coaches and your nutritionists and all that, uh, you know, and, and they took care of that aspect for you and, and you were good. But then when you stop being uh, on the national team or you stop being coached, and you stop working out as much, all of a sudden you're left to yourself and you have no idea how to eat. You just, okay, well, I'll just keep eating. And yeah. 
I remember I met, I met a couple of, um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, athletes like that, that, you know, like you would think an athlete knows how to, uh, to eat, but the thing is, no, an athlete is good at what he does like nutrition and training. That's, that's like another discipline altogether. That's, it takes, um, other professionals to, to help you with that. And yeah. you know, when you're on the national team, you have everybody, you have your whole, uh, entourage of health professionals to take care of that for you. But when you're off the team, well, you know, if you didn't, uh, yeah. if you didn't, uh, take time to kind of figure it out or you didn't, you know, you didn't pay too much attention, then now, you know, you're left on your own and you, you gain a lot of weight. You yeah. Know, you don't understand how to balance it out. And, and a lot of times when you, even when you research, uh, bodybuilders and how they do things, a lot of them are, are talking nonsense. And you got to remember a lot of these guys are on steroids too. So like what they can yeah. do on steroids is, is a little bit different. Like they could kind of get away with a lot of uh, nonsense. Another thing is that the other nonsense that you're talking about, especially for competition day, for competition day, I don't want to go like a bodybuilder. First of all, I'm dehydrated. I'm starving. My muscles cannot contract well. Uh, I'm going to be very weak in competition. So that's going to result in very bad results. So like them, they can do that because you're just going to pose on stage and that's it. They're not fighting someone else. So, uh, for example, you see other like judokas, you know, wear your uh, sauna suit and then drink two gallons of water. And then you kind of come to competition. You're very dehydrated. You're going to cut all the weight. I don't want to cut water weight like I, for, for several reasons. Dehydration can cause very bad headaches, very bad mood. And also your muscles cannot contract well and you're not going to fight well. So uh, we need a more balanced approach in judo. Like uh, we don't want to arrive like Conor McGregor when he was like a zombie, basically. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and you know, like the, the way I look at it in terms of um, uh, in terms of weight class and cutting and all that, like you have to decide like what's your what's your weight, what's your weight class? And in where you are, actually, uh, where you are uh, actually. So, do you have to cut weight to uh, to be in in your category, or do you have to gain weight? Now, if you want to gain weight, then ideally you want to gain muscle. But that's usually done on the off season. You don't do that, like uh, you know. So, and if you want to cut weight, you have to give yourself enough time, because if you have to cut weight, let's say you have, um, for example, fifteen pounds to lose to be in your weight category. Well, you don't start doing it a month before, uh, before competition, you know, or you don't do it the last week or two, because now, now you have no choice, but to cut water weight. So now you have to dehydrate yourself, which is, which is insane. It's going to affect your performance, you know, so you might not actually perform as well. So, but, so you have to take, you have to do things, um, well in advance. So that's why I preach to people. Don't, don't go too crazy in terms, like if you, if you're competing at, um, for example, uh, 73 kilos, right? Like don't, don't go, don't go too high. Don't let yourself go get too fat because you got to remember that the fatter you are, the longer time it's going to take to, to, to take that off. Yeah. Because if we respect the 1% rule, 1% of your body weight in pounds per week, that's how much time it's going to take you. So for example, if you have, um, let's say you weigh 200 pounds and you got 20 pounds to lose, then, you know, it's going to take you and, and 1% is a lot, you know? So like the more time you give yourself, the easier it's going to be for you to, to, uh, to get to that weight. So you want to like stay within, I would say 10 is pretty extreme. 10 pounds. I would say five pounds, five, five, five to 10 pounds maximum of your, of, uh, over your actual weight. Yeah. Because if you go too high, it's like, dude, you're going to, it's, it's not even worth it because the process of trying to cut down too fast and then having to dehydrate yourself like uh, the, the day of, or the day before it's going to, it's going to radically affect your performance. So you're going to, you're not going to perform as well anyway. So there was no point to, to all the, all the foolishness, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. It, if that makes sense. I know it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of information maybe, but yeah, this is a, uh... This is, a, like I said, this is, we need a blueprint on this. Not a lot of us know how to actually control our weight. And um, we go through, not me, I, I compete at my weight. Like whatever it is, I go, I step on the scale. That's if I compete. I've competed like five times maybe. Mm -hmm. um, 
but everyone else, like especially those who are regular competitors, upcoming teenagers or young adults, uh, I think they would they would need a more uh, balanced approach that would give them ease because a lot of them are just going through these drastic measures and they're feeling like very miserable. And uh, something uh, like yourself, your personal trainer, and you've grappled for over a decade, um, I think you know you can help us all like in a way. Yeah, yeah, I'd be glad to. Like, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize that it was something that was, uh, 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 that that's. I didn't realize that it was something that us grapplers really needed. You know, is it like yeah, uh, like the, the conventional wisdom from nutrition it comes from bodybuilding. Like it, <sighs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like eat the eat six times a day, eat uh, egg whites, low, egg. no no carbs. Like that's the unhealthiest thing you can do. Yeah, no, you need you need carbs, you know, and um. Yeah, so that's it. Like that approach right there in terms of tracking your weight, uh, tracking your weight and, you know, taking the average on a weekly basis and then comparing. And then, of course, like staying within five to ten, like five to ten pounds, uh, you know, or even just staying at your weight year round, too. That would be the ideal thing, you know, but yeah. for people who like to uh, who aren't able to do that, who are disciplined enough, then it's OK to be a little bit over. But don't don't let yourself go too much because the the more you let yourself go, the longer it's going to take and the more you're going to have to suffer, especially if you, um, and you're going to suffer a lot more if you, if you just wait like a month before your competition and now you have 20 pounds to lose, that makes no sense. That's now, now you're going to, you're going to have to go, you're going to have to do things in an extreme way. And if you start dieting, if you start cutting calories, too much calories, you become too restrictive. You're going to lose muscle mass. So I agree. So yeah. then like there was no point More water from your muscle is going to be very bad. Yeah. Then you're going to get to competition and it's, uh, you know, it's not good to be dehydrated, you know, because like it's, it's a really important part of, uh, it's like your body is 70% water. So of course, if you dehydrate just even like, uh, you know, two, three, 4%, 5%, like it's going to affect your performance and it's going to affect your cognitive ability too. So everything right. is affected, like physical performance, timing, focus, everything. So doing it like that is insane and sometimes i think that the coaches don't know any other way so like they'll just tell their athletes yeah no problem just uh let's just sauna we'll just sauna you uh we'll sauna out the 10 20 pounds that you have which is insane you know like there's there's you know and, and sometimes the coaches don't know any better or they just kind of um um they didn't uh uh i don't know maybe they didn't have time they were too busy and they didn't pay attention and it was kind of oh man last minute okay all right, how much weight do you have to lose? Okay, put on a, put on a, a sweatsuit. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about trainers. Uh, one of my old trainers was actually an Olympic athlete. She competed in the 2008 Olympics. Mm -hmm. And one of her uh, uh, students, uh, who was uh, like a cadet, something like 17-year-old, mm -hmm. he was having a hard time losing weight. And she was like, okay, here's what you do. You eat only protein. Like, don't even do the salad. Just eat the protein and uh, run every day with, like, a heavy jacket and drink tons and tons and tons of water. <laughs> what are you trying to do? She's like, the last week you do nothing but that. And I'm like, what? No. Like, the guy had headaches, crampings, uh, and eventually, like, did not get past round two. So what's the point? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's not the right way to do it. It's, um, you know, that, that just goes to show that just because somebody is, uh, is, is, uh, is an Olympic athlete, it has nothing to do with, um, doesn't mean they know what they're talking about in terms of nutrition. You know, and that's, that's a terrible approach. Like, you know, like if you don't eat, how are you going to live? How are you going to train even, you know? And like, imagine you're eating just a dry piece of chicken. Yeah, you're going to, you're going to feel horrible. Uh, you know, you're not going to sleep. Everything's going to be affected. It's going to like, uh, it's going to mess with your hormone levels. You're going to drop too your much. Your digestion will suck. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Like you just have to, uh, it's just a lot of it is, it's because, you know, there's so much information out there and yeah. people talking nonsense that we don't know what to believe, <clears throat> right? But yeah, at the same right. time, it's like uh, certain things. Well, from where I'm sitting, it's, it's common sense. Like my approach is very logical in the sense that like it's not um, it's not anything extreme. It's very balanced. It's very healthy, and that's what I do. Like I don't uh, 
You know, I don't, uh, for example, right now, I'm, I used to compete in 73. Yeah. And uh, how tall are you? Me, I'm, I'm five, uh, five, seven, five, eight. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's very good for, for 73. Yeah. And, but right now I'm at 69, uh, I'm at 69 kilos. And I used to compete at 73. Yeah. But I was always about, you know, 69, 72 kind of. And uh, so now like my, I haven't decided yet, but because people who compete at 73 usually cut down to get to 73. If yeah. I compete in 73, I'm just walking in there. I'm not even, you know, cutting weight or yeah. anything. But if I want to have an advantage, like I would have to cut down to 66. 66. Right. But I'm 69 right now. But the thing is, do I want to put my, my body through that? Like I, I could still probably lose um, maybe a kilo, you know, of, uh, of fat. So that's about 2.2 pounds. I yeah. could probably still lose that, you know, maybe two to three pounds. I don't have that much fat on my body at this point. So then I would have to like sweat it out, sweat out the rest. Mm -hmm. So that's why like I'm very, and then I looked at the, um, um, I look at the weight categories for master's division. And here's the thing. They're different. It's, yeah, they're different. They're, it's, the range is bigger. It's, so it's plus or minus 66 kilos. Yeah. And then plus or minus 81 kilos. Whoa. So you see, so then I'm like, okay, if I compete, and I, I'm still allowed to compete with the, the seniors, like the 20-year-olds if I want. Yeah. But those guys are at, at, the, at the brown belt, black belt level. They're all like competing for the national Monster. team. So yeah, they're, they're monsters, man. And those guys cut weight. So if I compete with those guys, I would have to be, I would have to, for me to actually have an advantage somewhat, I would have to go down to, to 66. Yeah. But if I compete just with uh, people in the veterans. master's division, the veterans, there's no point in me cutting because the range is so, you know, like I would stay with um, uh, pl plus minus 66. I'd be fine. I'd be fine where I am. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. But my coach, he, 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 he told me that what I should be doing is competing with, I should, I should still compete with the, uh, uh, the seniors, like the younger guys. And then when it's time for me to, uh, when there's a competition that I want to win, that's when I go with the, the master's division for two reasons. One, because I'll have more fights and more practice mm -hmm. and then I'll get better. I'll get more experience. And then when I get to, and then the competitions that I do want to win, that's when I register myself in the master's division. You know, that's, a good, that's a good strategy. Yeah. So, so that's the strategy. Um, but the thing is, he told me, if you go compete with the 20 year olds and all that, like, don't expect to win, like do your best, yeah. but be there to learn essentially. So mm -hmm. it's just going to be me being tossed around for the most part, giving, I'll do my best to give, put up a fight. But then when it's time for me to compete, competitions that I really do want to win, that's when I go up to uh, the master's division. Mm -hmm. um, so would I, would I even cut, would I, would I even bother me cutting to, uh, uh, if I compete with the 20 year olds, would I bother cutting to 66? I'm thinking about it now. And as we're talking, I'm thinking, no, I wouldn't. Why? Like, there's no, you know? Yeah. Like I wouldn't have you to cut when I, when I fight with the, the guys in the master's division, why would I cut to fight these guys? You know? Like, yeah. Um, there's this thing I've noticed uh, also like the height for example if you, let's say you're 5'8 which is around 172 centimeters mm -hmm. usually their their weight as it's their category for example um, like the 72 and the height it usually matches the the weight like 72 73 one like 5'8 usually they're in the 73 kilogram mm -hmm. uh, shorter like five six guys they're usually in the 66, for example, uh, but the tall guys like 5'11", 6 feet and up, it can be anything like open weight. It can be even open weight. For example, I was buying my uh, my judo gi and I got a uh, size four, which is a big mistake because it says it's for the 180 centimeters tall or 5'11". I'm 181, like one centimeter away from six feet. Mm. So I got it for my size, but it looked like, a, like those big, Sack of robes, basically. And I was like, what the hell? Why is this so big? And then the the, the guy at the shop, he's like, no, not the guy at the shop. The, the guy I was training with, he said, well, yeah, but this is a Mizuno like, 
size four. Basically, a Japanese guy, your height is gonna be in the at least plus like minus one hundred kilos. So your your size should be like you should buy a size three. So I think like look, and um, I think it's the the more closer to your weight your height is, it's better for you for maintenance reasons and also to be fresh in competition. Maybe I, again, I might be wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, like uh, I remember my my coach having this conversation with uh, this guy who was on the national team, and he still is on the national team, and um, he was. Um, <clears throat> I think he was competing at 81, but the thing is, he's naturally big. This guy, like he he walks around like closer to what's what's the uh, what's the category? What's the division like above 81 kilos? Minus 90. Minus 90. Yeah, yeah. So my coach told him, you know, the thing is, you're you're more of a natural. Um, um, you said minus 90, right? Yeah. More of a minus 90. So the thing is, you might it might be better for you to compete at there because it's going to be better for you mentally because you don't have to go through the stress of always making weight and then dehydrating yourself and then you get to competition and you don't do as well you know because sometimes people think that they have an advantage because they're going to cut weight and they're going yeah. to be strong but just the process of cutting weight the toll it takes on you on on your physical body as well as your 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 your, your mental uh your mental yeah. health like it's just gonna you're not going to feel hell, as, yeah. yeah, it's it's hell, and you're not going to feel as good. You're not going to be tip top shape for for that uh, for that uh, for that competition. Sometimes you're better off. You know what? Let me just fight in my uh, walk and weight division, so to speak. Yeah. And then you'll have more fun. You'll be less stressed. You'll be more focused on training. So, like you know, a month before the competition, a month or two, you'll you, you'll still be like training and no, you train. You eat the way you want. You're well rested. Your recovery is good. As opposed to, oh man, it's two two months before the competition. Okay, I got to drop weight now. You know, two yeah. three months uh, two three months before your competition, you, you're you're tr you're trying to cut weight and you're training at the same time. So, and if you if you don't know how to do things, then you're trying to cut weight, but you're doing it hard. You're cutting your weight really hard by restricting a lot of calories, and on top of that, you still got to train. So yeah. trainings are going to be crap. You're going to feel like crap. And then by the time you get to competition, you won't be, at, you won't be a hundred percent at all. Sometimes you're better off just like, you know what? Okay. I'm going to fight at my walking weight. And you know, like usually the two, three months that I take to cut weight and to do all this stuff, I'm just going to continue training and be comfortable. So you'll be in, in, in better shape mentally, physically, and you would have had, you would have trained hard the whole time up until the competition and then boom, then you would actually perform better and you would have more fun. So I remember overhearing that discussion and that was pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, again, the, my first competition was actually like that. Um, like I said, I'm a little bit shying away from six feet, but I was 69 or 70 kilos. So that's like really skinny. Mm -hmm. uh, my coach said, uh, it was my first competition. Uh, can you get down to 66? It was like, they told me this a week before the competition. <laughs> I thought about it. I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Because in a way, as my height, he was like in the minus 100 and the plus 100. You want me to go down to 66? Like, I'm not like my body is going to be super weak and super skinny. And also, like, I remember seeing the 66. They were all short, stocky guys. So they could have toppled me easily. So I walked in with food in my stomach and water and everything. And I was like 70 kilograms. Uh, and I won. Because I not, I did not think of the weight and I was just eating uh, and sleeping well and just training and preparing. Like the first competition you do, please do not think about your weight. Just go in, walk in, whatever it is, just gain the experience. It's your first competition either way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like when you get to, you know, um, when you get to to a very high level and you're on the national team, well, then you're going to have like a, like a whole bunch of nutritionists following you. You're going to have doctors, you're going to have physio. Yeah. So then it's a different game, right? But if you're just doing this for fun, if you're if you're just competing because you know you you want that experience, you want to improve a little bit faster, and it's just uh, you know, then I wouldn't even bother with the weight cut. You know, like if no. you're if you if you have excess excessive body fat, then I think just for your own health and for yes, your own, cut it out. Then yes, like you know, drop it. And I always I always preach fifteen percent body fat for men. I yeah. think 
it's very doable. You look very good at 15% with clothes on or without your shirt on. And it's just a healthy place to be. And if ever you want to get down to from 15 to 10%, it's not, it's only 5%. So it's not going to take you that long. You could, you, if you do things properly, you're talking, let's say, you know, it could be done in maybe anywhere between five to 10 weeks, so to speak, you know, like, uh, so yeah. that's it. So you want to stay somewhere where it's very comfortable and it's easy for you to maintain and you have the energy and you're not starving. And, you know, you recover properly from your workouts and all. So 15%, yeah. I think it's a good place to be. Like, it depends on genetics, but I would say, well, when I say it depends on genetics, some people are more like 18%, you know? Yeah. Because they're like more um, endomorph, you know, type, type of body. Yeah, and there's also like the bone structure. And the, I saw skinny guys who were heavier than me. I was like, why are you so heavier than me? Mm -hmm. Like, they really have big joints. Yeah, yeah, That's but something I'm, else. I'm talking about like body fat percentage. Sure. Yeah, yeah, also that. Yeah, I mean, like, like even like the heavier guys genetically, mm -hmm. no one is like super big. That that usually comes from bad eating habits and bad home training, like from they were little kids. Yeah, yeah, and exactly, and also like the heavier you are, think about it. The more, um, the more it puts a strain on your joints, and 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 falling is a bad thing. Like if you're heavier and you're getting thrown all the time, it's going to, it's going to be even worse on your shoulders, your, your back, your ankles, your knees or whatnot, you know? So yeah. it, like, that's why I preach like 15%, 15% is very doable, you know, like and not, you could just maintain that afterwards. So it's about like changing your lifestyle and your habits and all. Um, and then, yeah, if you had 15% then just, you know, like fight at your category, you know, now, if you're, <clears throat> Um, yeah, because the, the people who, who have like a lot of weight to lose to make their weight category, it's usually people who have a lot of excess fat when you think about yeah. it, because if you're at, let's say you're walking around at 10% body fat, how much, <laughs> what do you want to cut? You know, Nothing. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're going to cut, you're not going to look gonna cut really good. Things. Like you're like, like you look at, like if you're, if you have decent muscle size, like you're gonna, you're gonna be one of the better looking in society as, as a whole. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And for competition, like forget about cutting, you're already 10% body fat, or even if you're yeah, 12, 15% exactly. body fat, it's like, is it really, it's not even worth it to cut weight. You know, like yeah. you would have to like weigh the pros and cons. It depends on your objective and all that, but it might not, um, it might not be worth it. If you're like at 15% body fat, like, you know, and you look at uh, what your weight actually is and what your division is, then it's for, for yeah. you like, okay, well, is it worth it? Or do I want to have fun and, and, you know, compete and be healthy, have a good time. Exactly. Well, Longevity. Yeah. Because you know, like the competition itself is stressful enough. So if you're starting off and it's your first competition, why would you want to, I wouldn't tell an athlete, like add that stress to their, to their lives. Like, no, let's, let's enjoy the experience. Forget about weight cutting. Let's get a couple of competitions in. And then once you get the nerves out of the way, after you do a couple and you just, you know, you, you, you show up there and it's, it's like a, another day at the club kind of thing. Then yeah. after that, and you want to get competitive, then, okay, well, we, we could see from there, right. If you want to compete at a higher level, that's, that's another story. But if you're just doing it for fun, just doing it to improve, you know, then I, I don't, um, I wouldn't recommend weight cutting once again, but if you're, if you're, if you have a lot of weight to lose, then for your health, you should and, do it. Yeah. And for performance reasons, yeah, definitely you should cut weight, but you shouldn't do it for a competition. You should do it just, just for yourself. It. Yeah. For yourself. Yeah. I agree. Uh, Hey, listen, man. Um, I gotta go. No so, problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was a very good uh, talk, especially during nutrition because not a lot of people know about this, especially me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's very good to have this uh, particular blueprint. I think anyone can take that segment and listen to it for multiple things like nutrition, dehydration, you know, keeping a lean weight year round, et cetera. Uh, thank you so much for this. Um, again, I think you can help a lot of people with this. I cannot stress this enough. And also, you know, judo can translate to a lot of things in life. Like uh, if you read Mind Over Muscle, you can see, you know, we talked about respect, being feared, et cetera. Uh, you know, it can really, branch out as it's not just a martial art it's not like basketball it's so many things around it yeah yeah no i'll, I'll definitely like uh, take that to heart and um try to you know create something create some content to you know to help everybody out uh, i enjoyed the talk too 
like thank you very much for your time it was very cool of you to uh to accept uh doing this with me and uh yeah i just i figured it'd be uh it'd be fun because we're both uh we're both uh, judokas yeah it was fun to talk to another judoka and uh, yeah it was it was great i had a good time yeah me too man me too thank you for your knowledge okay yeah and thank you uh well thank you for yours <laughs> Okay. All right, man. Gotta see you soon. Okay. Yes, sir. This. Thank you.